afternoon everyone welcome to our pre-show drive um, that's about it for now <laughs> we're driving around having a look for some some lions uh, male and female that we found this morning and it's a very very warm afternoon very very warm it's about 34 and 96 i think 34 degrees and 96 degrees fahrenheit somewhere around there so very very warm i'm just checking very carefully now while we're driving looking for any tracks signs of these lions hope all of you are having a great day wherever you are around the world what is it monday today is it monday today Vian? what is monday <laughs> exactly i don't know well if it's a monday and you're all at work i um, hope it's a good start to the week we, we do lose track of days out here um what else has been going on? Uh, what exciting news have I got for you from the camp? Uh, not much. Not much. Steph came back today after a weekend out. Uh, not that that's exciting, but he's back. <laughs> and what else? Um, We're probably going to have a look for these lions for a portion of the afternoon and then potentially try head back into that area where we had a male leopard this morning a big male known as tingana so that could be interesting so i'm hoping we have an exciting afternoon i'm sure we will regardless of what we see it should be fun and i'm still i'm hoping for elephants i was just saying to via who's on camera with me this afternoon that uh, we haven't seen elephants for a while, and I'm, I'm, I start missing them. I love having the elephants around. So hopefully we get one or two passing through fairly soon, or maybe a few herds. That would be great. sign of these lions so they just moved off i wouldn't be surprised if they're just lying in the shade somewhere in this big thick block off to my right but we will keep searching yeah. my legs are so itchy i've got a few tick bites from all the bush walking that we've been doing and it's incredibly itchy show you but I don't think it's safe lifting my leg up here while I'm trying to drive <laughs> and then uh, so Brent's gonna be on the other vehicle today and he'll um, he's also out. I think he's going to try and look for Karula this afternoon. And then Jamie's doing a bush walk again, which is great. And I think tomorrow morning, Steph will be back on bush walk. And then perhaps one of us will get a, a break, which is nice. see you shortly I'm not sure who's going to start the show I've got a feeling it's going to be Brent and then uh, we'll see you and we'll do our formal formal welcome <laughs> so bye for now this program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to a scorching hot day here in the African bush. We're in search of Africa's big cats and all the other wonderful creatures. Come join us. This is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. You are live. 
to Torwood, Malibu, and... Oh no, I've suddenly drawn a blank. Providence. Providence, thank you very much, Kat. Uh, it's uh, gonna be great having three schools aboard all at the same time. I'm looking forward to taking you on your own private South African safari adventure. What a fun way to spend the school time. So what I'm looking for is leopards at the moment. This morning, I followed a mom leopard with two babies for three hours, and I'm hoping she's gonna be around here somewhere in the shade where it's nice and cool. It's about 90 degrees. Degrees Fahrenheit, guys, so it is a stinker today. And of course, what are those? Those are not leopard tracks. And remember, I want questions from you guys. Send in as many questions as possible. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, it's great to have all three of those schools with us today. So, about 8 a.m. this morning, I left that female leopard about two football fields that way. So, we're going to make our way around, see if she's still there. If she's not there, I think she's. She's left her babies in a nice shaded area, so hopefully we'll be able to find, if not all three leopards, at least two of them. Okay, I was also hoping there might be some elephants out near the water holes, but not so far today. Arun would like to know how hot can it get in Africa? Well, in this part of Africa, it gets to around on the hottest day, about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can get very hot. Average summer temperatures uh, are from 90 to 100 at the heat of the day. Okay, so no elephants playing in the mud wallow. Uh, so we're gonna keep looking for that leopard. Now what happened is I think that female leopard went hunting for a bit this morning and then when it got hot, she probably came for a drink around here uh, and then she might have snoozed somewhere in the shade till it gets cooler again. She's got two cubs, so she's got a lot of hard work keeping dinner on the table for her two babies, but she's a very good hunter and a very good mother. So hopefully we can find them. But I'm not the only one out here in the African bush. Uh, let's go meet some other members of the team who are out and about looking for animals just for you. Good afternoon everyone and welcome on Safari Live. My name is Byron and on camera is VM with me this afternoon. Hope you are all having a wonderful day and welcome to our schools that are watching. Uh, Malibu, Torwood and Providence Elementary. It's lovely to have all of you with us and please send us your questions. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and we'll gladly answer them for you. So we are looking for lions everyone. That is our plan for this afternoon well one of our plans we've got a few different plans so we're hopefully going to show you a lot of different animals so we are looking for a big male and a female lion that we saw this morning um, very very early this morning and it's a very very hot afternoon so I think these lions are lying in the shade somewhere and they're probably resting until later this evening Angeli, you want to know where do lions go in the winter? So Angeli, lions will always be around. Um, and in Africa, we don't have animals that hibernate. Like in America, in North America, where you are all from, you have bears, for example, that, um, that hibernate. They move into caves and they sleep in the winter. None of our animals do that. They are always around throughout the year. So the lions will always be around. They don't mind the cold, and it doesn't get nearly as cold here as it does where you are back home. All right, so Brent and I are not the only ones out on safari this afternoon. Um, Jamie is out on her bushwalk. Let's go say hi. Hello 
and welcome to the on foot portion of your sunset safari and a very special welcome welcome to Malibu, Tallwood and Providence Elementary Schools. I hope you are all really very excited. My name is Jamie and this afternoon the gentleman behind the camera is Jandre and he's currently having to bend down because I'm bending down and still managing to keep the camera incredibly steady. Isn't he a genius at this? Now we've got some really exciting plans for this afternoon because we're going to be helping Byron with a very special task and that's I want to show you exactly what that task involved. Now whenever we are searching for an animal we are looking for the footprints that they leave in the soil and now this is a very special track and I know what particular track this is. It's something big, it's got a paw and it's got toes here. This is one toe, this is another toe, and another toe, and another toe, and this is the back of its foot with three lobes at the back. And this is a really very fresh lion track. It's only a few hours old. Now this morning we were fortunate enough to walk to actually see these lions while we were walking back to camp and they were right just a few meters from where we are now. So we're going to be trying to help Byron by walking on foot very very carefully to see if we can't find where these lions have gone. Now it's not just us out here. There is a gentleman called Herbie and he helps to keep us safe and helps to walk ahead and look out for them. Gracie, you want to know how long lions live. The males will live shorter than the females. Females you're looking at around 13 to 14 years old and males only average, average, around 10 or so years old. And that's because male lions fight a lot so they often have a slightly shorter life expectancy than the females. So kind of like your big dogs at home, Gracie. And thank you for sending through your questions and all of you can send through your questions in the same way. I want you to imagine like you're here with us. The sun is beating down, your heart is beating fast because you're looking for lions. We've got one track there where I pointed it out to you. Here's the next one. So he took a very big step here and another big step here and another step here and another step here and so on and he's walking in that direction. Now Sophia, you want to know why Africa looks so dry? Well Sophia, we've just come out of one of the, well hopefully come out of one of the worst droughts that South Africa's been in in the last hundred years. So we actually haven't had that much good rain in the last two or so years. We've had a little bit because I promise you a couple of months ago Sophia this was just dust. It was just dust and dirt. There was no grass, the trees were dying, the animals are getting sick and thin because there wasn't enough food for them. But luckily we've had a little bit of rain, so it is starting to get a bit, a bit better, starting to get a bit greener. But bear in mind, every day is very, very hot. It's 30 three degrees today, which is 91 in Fahrenheit, so it's really hot. We're going to go and search for these lions. We're going to track them down by following their footprints. While we do that, Brent has been even more successful and he's got something really exciting to show you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We found the, the leopards. There they are. So the mom and both the babies are here. Now, this is one of Africa's most stealthy cats. So I wonder if she's had a successful day hunting. I don't think so. And she's come back to where she hid the cubs. cubs. Let's just try to get into a slight better position. Isn't this exciting, guys? Leopards, not one, but three. It is very hot, so they're hiding in the shade a little bit. So that's the mommy there. Oh, she's moving a little bit. Now, if we watch her. Oh, I'm trying to see if the babies are gonna pop out. And there's a baby, to, one baby to the left of her and one baby to the right of her. So just hiding in that shade there is a little female. I 
Look at that, there we go. I can't see whether it's a little girl or the little boy. It looks like a little girl. Her name is Shongile, which means exquisitely beautiful. Hi, Claire. Claire's wondering how big can leopards grow? Well, Claire, that one there, that's an adult female. She probably weighs 90 to 100 pounds. Oh, you can see the other baby behind her. There's the other, the other cub, the young male. And a big male leopard can get to probably about 180 pounds in this area. And so, a whole oh, big cat. So a big male leopard would weigh about the same as me. Not nearly as big as a lion, of course. A big male lion can weigh 450 pounds. Now we're quite lucky, normally at this time of the day, they'll be fast asleep, but she might have made a kill somewhere. She might have just come back. We spotted her walking back towards the cubs, so she might have been coming to fetch the cubs. Now, Jasmine's wondering why leopards have their patterns, and there you can see why, Jasmine. It's so they can hide. It's, it breaks up their outline. It enables them to be camouflaged, so they can hide when they try to catch their dinner. Okay, let's get a bit closer. Now, hi, Jewel. Jewel wants to know, what do leopards do when they're hunting for food? Well, Jewel, leopards are ambush predators. So if they see an antelope, they'll then sneak up to it. And when they're very close, maybe 10 or 12 feet, well, they then burst out and they can go very, very fast. And then they jump onto the animal and then they'll eventually grab it by its throat and stop it breathing. See where she went, looking where the mom went. Ah, oh, there she is. Okay, let's just get into a good spot. Katie's wondering, are leopards carnivores? Now what that means, do leopards eat meat, Katie? There we go, she's out in the open. Oh, she's about to disappear into the shade there. I'm hoping she lies down. That looks like a good shady spot when it's hot. Are you gonna lie down? Her name is Karula. Now, Katie, leopards are carnivores. They only eat meat. And they will sometimes chew on a bit of grass, but their main diet is meat. Okay, let's move again. Um, you can see there's the little male sleeping in the shade there. You got him? Here he is. Now we can see those spots of a leopard working in, as camouflage, because only with the zoom can we spot him. Blessing would like to know how old the leopard cubs are. Blessing, they're nearly 10 months old. Now that's the little boy. His name is Hosanna, which means the little prince. Balin's wondering, how do the leopards survive in this heat? Well, Balin, the trick is, have a sluice in the shade and don't move too much. So leopards can't sweat, so they don't generally move around too much when it's very hot. Uh, the way they cool down, you can see that little boy is panting heavily, so he's breathing very quickly. And what he's doing while he does that is there's lots of blood vessels on, in, on his tongue and in his mouth. Oh, Karula's gonna come out into the open. There she is. So 
So as I was saying, so there are lots of blood vessels. So what happens is all the hot blood goes into their mouth and they breathe quickly, bringing cool air over their tongue. And uh, that then cools down that blood and sends the cool blood to the rest of their body. And that's how leopards cool down. Patience is wondering, how do we know what animal it is just by seeing their footprints? Whoa. Well, patience, it's because I've been doing this a long time and I've had very good teachers. And every time you see an animal make a footprint, we go look and double check and learn. But while we've been looking at mom and the little brother, the little female has snuck right up next to us. There she is. Hello, beautiful. Oh, and snork around behind us. So she snuck up out of nowhere to right next to us. And it looks like mom might be leaving the babies here to go hunting again. Hi, Kristen. Kristen would like to know, are leopards good climbers? They are very good climbers, Kristen. Uh, out of all the big cats, they're the best climbers. They're able to jump up all sorts of trees. Now I'm just going to try to see where the mom's going. There she is up ahead. Hi, Preston. Preston's wondering, look at that, you can see how good that camouflage is. Preston's wondering, do, elef uh, do elephants, do leopards stay in packs? They don't. You'll only ever find leopards together when there's a mom and babies, and sometimes when uh, the female is looking for a boyfriend. Other than that, they are mostly solitary, so they stay by themselves. Now, I think mom's going to go hunting. Uh, so not mostly leopards hunt at night, but this particular female likes to hunt during the day. Hi, Jordan. Jordan wants to know, do we name all the animals? Well, not all the animals, but the, the leopards we do, Jordan, and the male lions, uh, the ones we see regularly, we do name. And occasionally the odd wildebeest, Jordan. I've got, there's a wildebeest... Uh, to the east of us that he looks very funny to me so I named him Gnormless Gnorman the Gnu. Of course Gnu is another name for wildebeest. Okay well we're gonna wait here and see what these leopards do while we do that let's go see what Jamie's up to on foot. We are still searching for these lions creeping through the bushes. Now, it's impossible for us to ever sneak up upon an animal like a lion, and that's because they can hear so well. They're constantly on alert. They're animals that are always paying attention to their surroundings, which is why it's so important that we do exactly the same thing. So we're moving through an area that's actually quite nice and open. It's not too thick. It would be nice if it was really open, and then we could see the lions far away, and it would be perfect. But we're following their footprints through the sand, and I'm looking for a nice example to show you, but I can't find one. But we're going to start creeping slowly, but surely. Surely. Mm. Now, Arun, you want to know whether or not we find bones lying around. Yes, all the time. And so much so that I'm pretty confident we can find you a bone before you have to go to your next class. So I'm going to be looking for, look, see, all sorts of things that we find here. It's not a bone, but it is an eggshell. And it might be from a bird. It might also be from a reptile, perhaps something like a snake or a lizard, although I think it's too solid. See, it's quite solid, it's got a hard shell, and that makes me think it might be something like a bird. Generally reptiles, most of the reptiles lay eggs that are very, very soft. The eggs are soft as opposed to something like a chicken egg, which of course has a very hard shell. So this might have been a bird that hatched, it might have been something that got caught by another bird. There are lots of different birds out here that eat eggs, different creatures that eat eggs. So anything could have happened to have left that eggshell on the ground. But we find all sorts of things. We find insects and scorpions and spiders and snakes. And yes, lots and lots of bones as well. Whether they are from the lion's kills that they've made recently, or perhaps hyenas have been through and dragged a bit of the bone with them, we very often see 
bones. I saw something moving, but it's jumped away. I think it might have been a grasshopper. But I'm keeping my voice down because I don't want to scare the lions. It's not because I'm scared of the lions, it's because I don't want to give them a fright so that they run away from us. I want to be able to show you without the animals being stressed at all or without them feeling as though they are under threat or under pressure from us. But we're slowly but surely creeping through, checking everywhere for tracks. And we also find stuff like this, and I'm gonna tell you about this in a moment, but since we're talking about lions, Miles, you wanted to know if lions have a special job depending on their gender. Not really, although yes and no, let's put it that way. Both the, the, mom, the females and the male lions will hunt, so both of them are capable of hunting. Often what will happen is the females will do a lot of the hunting if the males are with them, and the males will come in and take quite a lot of their food. But the males have a very important job in that they've got to patrol a huge territory and make sure that they keep other males out. Females don't have to worry too much about that. They've got to roar a few times, just make sure that the other prides know where they are and the other prides aren't going to come in. But male lions have to, have to defend their territory or else something will come in, something like another male lion. Now this, what I'm looking at at the moment, is very old, very dry elephant dung. And it might seem really gross that I'm picking up an elephant's poo. And an, you should remember that you don't ever play with an animal's poo unless an adult says that it's okay. But I'm playing with elephant dung because an elephant only eats grass and sticks and twigs. So I'm not worried about it. It's perfectly okay to play with. And this is very old elephant poo, but just look how rough it is. See how much of the grass is still there? How much of it is undigested? Now, let's look at something else. I'm gonna throw it, pop it down. Let's look at something else. Let's look at some dung that probably came from an impala, so something like an antelope. Look at how much better, let me try to do it this way. Look at how much better the antelope is at digesting its food. See how there's hardly any big pieces of grass in there? They eat exactly the same thing. Well, elephants eat more trees as well, but impala will also eat trees. So impala elephants eat the same thing. Yes, an elephant eats a lot more than an impala, but an impala is much, much better at digesting its food. And that's because impala essentially have four stomachs, whilst an elephant only has one, like you or me. Impala have four, so they actually end up, what they do is they nibble off some grass or some leaves and they swallow it and they chew it and then they pull it back up. So it's almost not like vomiting, but they push the food back up into their mouths and they chew it again. So they chew it twice and then they swallow it and it goes to the th second and the third and the fourth stomachs. So they've got four, whereas an, an elephant only has one just like us, which is why you see such big pieces of grass in elephant dung and not in antelope dung. Right, I just thought I saw some white. I thought it was a bone for you, but it's not. Okay, let's start creeping. I think let's go this way forward. The lions have come through here. They stopped to lie down for a little bit and then they slowly moved on. So it's important that we're walking nice and carefully, making sure to stop and check every now and again, just to make sure that they're not around. Nope, that's just a log. And often what I like to do is go through to those big termite mounds like the one over there and check and see because often there's a lot of shade around those termite mounds and also often the big animals will use them as a nice point to sit up and look down on what they're seeing so they can see further from the top of a termite mound. So I like to go and check there because often the animals will walk in that direction. Now let's just check and see if these lions aren't around here. I don't see any sign of the lions here. So we're gonna keep looking slowly but surely, carefully checking under every tree. And while we do that, Byron has found something very big. And look what we found, everyone, a big hippo in the water. Now, I thought it would be a good idea to come and have a look around the water because it's so hot. We might get animals coming down to drink. And isn't this a wonderful surprise to find a big hippo in this water, this tiny water hole. Now usually 
and what happens is the hippos move around at night to go eat and they feed on grass so they'll move through the clearings try to feed on as much grass as possible in the evenings and then the day they spend in the water because they actually have very sensitive skin so they don't like to be out in the open and I think I see something else coming down quickly sorry something just caught my eye looks like a zebra just want to see if we can show you before it moves away there it goes hang on you can see those wonderful stripes are oh, wonderful beautiful zebra look at that also feeding on the grass just like a hippo would have but look how well camouflaged it is between those trees very difficult to see kind of hiding from us a little bit Angeli, you want to know if the hippos are black? No, Angeli, they're not. They're more of a grayish color, um, but sometimes what happens when they lie in the water, like this hippo is doing over here, it, they also roll around in the mud. And the reason for that is to cover themselves to protect their skin from the very harsh sun. So they may appear a bit darker, but they're generally a gray color. Now look at that little bird on its back. It's called an oxpecker. Now that oxpecker looks like it's trying to clean a little wound on the hippo, a little scar, maybe feed on some ticks that might be around there. And the oxpeckers do generally feed on the ticks, but I think that one is trying to get to the wound on the, on the hippo. Zarya, the, the hippo is not quite sleeping like, like we sleep, but it is resting. And it is um, staying in the water to stay cool. So it does rest. And we need to remember, everyone, and all the little children watching now, and the animals out here in the, in the African bush don't really sleep like we sleep. None of them do. They do rest and they do... You could basically say they sleep, but they are always aware of what's going on around them. So they're always semi-awake. They never sleep like we sleep because they always have to be prepared for potential predators. So any dangerous animals around. Nina, the hippos are not slimy. Their skin generally is, is um, fairly, fairly rough, but, um, but I think if they lie in the water a lot, they could get a little smooth and slimy if you had to go and touch them while they're lying in the water, but generally the skin is quite rough. Jewel, the, these birds don't go inside the hippos' mouths. Um, that was a little bit of a, a myth, so we don't really see it often. Sometimes you'd see um, um, perhaps cartoons where the birds try and um, pick little pieces of food in that out of crocodiles' mouths and teeth or hippo. That doesn't really happen. We don't see that. And um, these birds will just sit on the animals and try and pick off the ticks and the little bugs. But isn't it wonderful to see this hippo? I'm so glad we decided to check the water and, and get and got to find him. We're going to leave him now, let him rest a little bit further. We don't want to disturb him. While we do that, let's head back to Brent, who's still with some leopards. So mom's left the two cubs. Now the little female, look at her, she's stalking her brother. Now this is gonna, there we go, hello big brother. Now even though they're the same age, you can see how much bigger the little male is. So the males do get quite a bit bigger than the females. They also grow much faster. Look at that. Now, mom went off to the east of us. Let's just try to get into another good position for these little guys. Okay, hold on guys, isn't this exciting? We're 
spending time with baby leopards live in the African bush. Hello, Arun. There we go. Arun would like to know. Are there more leopards or lions in Africa? In the whole of Africa, there are more leopards than lions because they live in the rainforests as well as in the savannah. And lions only live in the savannah. How's that? There we go. So lions only live in the savannah. Leopards live in the rainforests and savannas. So there are more leopards in the whole of Africa than lions. So this is what happens when mom goes hunting. They lie down like this. And they'll wait for her to come back and fetch them if she catches something. Now Blair would like to know, are there different types of leopards? In Africa, we've got one species of leopard, Blair. And, but there are other types of leopards. And you have snow leopards, clouded leopards that aren't directly related to these leopards. Amma leopards in Russia. But they are quite closely related. They're the most adaptable of the big cats. They can live in rainforest, they can live in desert, they can live in savannah, they can live next to the beach, they can live up in the mountains. So they can almost live anywhere, which makes them an incredible cat. Here we go, you can see her breathing heavily, trying to cool down. Jaden is wondering, what do leopards eat? Jaden, they eat small to medium-sized antelope normally, so they will eat some antelope as big as a white-tailed deer, but normally a bit smaller than that. But they also eat squirrels and mongoose and insects and birds, whatever they can catch. Oh, she's very, very hot. Oh. So I'm just trying to help someone get here. Standing by, Abel. I'm near the Mawati. There's a, a very big Tamboti tree on the northern side of that Shkova. I'm around there. Uh, just keep coming towards the Shkova and as soon as I get your vehicle order, I'll, I'll call you, I'll lead you in. Hello, Jewel. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to help Abel come find us. And Jewel would like to know, are leopards stronger than lions? They are not. Lions are the strongest cats in Africa and they're much, much stronger than, than leopards. And also, lions are very dangerous for leopards because if a lion sees a leopard, it'll try to catch it and kill it. Jordan's wondering, do leopards migrate? They don't really migrate. So they will have a territory. The males will migrate when they get to about two and a half, three years old. Oh, off they go. They might go for a drink. There's a little bit of water close by there. Oh, oh it's still, there we go. That's where her brother went. He just went for a drink. There's a little dry pan there. Uh, they, so the males will migrate away from where they were born, but the females will almost always stay close to where they were born. But they don't migrate in the, in the normal sense of the word migration. Oh, look, at she's going to go. Look at that. So they're playing. So this stalking is practice hunting, and they practice on each other. And they do a lot of this when mom leaves them alone when she goes to look for food. Well, he's coming back towards us. Hello, mister. Where are you off to? Hey, 
Hello, mister. Now, Katie's wondering how long is a leopard's tail? Well, Katie, it depends on the leopard. Uh, normally, it's almost the same size of its body without the head. So it all depends on how big the leopard is. Um, 1.6 meters to 1.8 meters normally. So the little female is still sitting up there, but I think she might follow her brother. But let's look at her while she's sitting so nicely out in the open. Okay, well we're going to wait to see what these leopards do next. While we do that, let's see how Jamie's hunting for lions on foot is going. Uh, here we go. Remember when you last saw me, I said that we would try and find you. Uh oh! <laughs> are you okay, Jandre? <laughs> I hope you are all feeling. <laughs> I wish I'd had a camera for that. I'm sorry. Are you alright? <laughs> You okay? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't see it either. Or I would have warned you. <laughs> okay. I hope none of you get motion sick really easily. Maybe car sick or something. You might have felt like you were flying all over the place. You did a marvelous job of not dropping the camera. Well done. Right. So remember how we said, how I said earlier that yes, it is very easy to find a bone out here. And that's because the lions, the leopards that you saw with Brent, they've all got to eat at some point or another. Hyenas, wild dogs, and what that means is that they often leave the rest of the animal behind. And in this case, we've got a bone to show you. And it is in fact a part of an animal's backbone. Now I don't know which animal it is. It's a little bit hard to tell. It's probably an antelope just by the size, maybe a very young buffalo. But this bone is the same bone that goes, that run up along your back. So it's a vertebra. And they'll all be piled on top of each other all the way up your back. So it's exactly the same as you or I, that we've got backbones as well. And what happens is they fit together sort of like this. Wait, that's, yeah, let's try this side. It might be better. They fit together and slot together so that they can move and twist and join, which is how the animals, just like us, if you bend down to touch your toes or you turn a little bit or you twirl, these bones will help you to do that because they can move. So that's what this bone is. It's the backbone. And through the middle, where I was looking at you from, through this bit here, that is where all of the important nerves and the blood, not the, not the blood, but the nerves, run from the brain to the rest of the body. So this is an animal's backbone. I'm going to leave it here in the bush for something perhaps to chew on. Something like hyenas maybe could come through, although there's nothing really left in those bones. And the last thing I want to show you, just quickly, remember how I said a reptile egg is soft? This is a reptile egg or an old hatched reptile egg. So there you go. Right, we're gonna carry on looking for those lions and hopefully Jandre won't fall over again, but if he does, well, I'll be ready to laugh at him. But in the meantime, let's go back to Byron who is still with his hippo. And now, uh, so I just wanted to stick with this hippo a little bit longer. We actually saw some monkeys, everyone that were here, but they've just run off. They're hiding away from us. Unfortunately, they're very, very shy, the little monkeys, and they have moved away, but the hippo has moved a little bit. He's just rolled in the water to try and cool down. You can see he's dipping his head into the water a little bit more, trying to stay cool. I'm sure it's quite comfortable in there. Preston, you want to know if hippos are mammals? Yes, Preston, they are. They're 100% mammal. They just spend a lot of time in the water, but they breathe out of land and they do feed and eat on land. They just lie and rest in the water during the day. Adam, the hippos, when they move out of the, the water, they go and eat the grass. They feed on grass. And that's it. It's amazing how these big animals get so big just from eating grass. So it just shows you it's very important to eat your vegetables, everyone. <laughs> So 
So, Alex, you want to know how big are the hippo's eyes? So those eyes are quite big. I think if we were very close, that eye would probably be around about that size. About that size, Alex, somewhere, somewhere around there, um, and they bulge a little bit on top of this, on top of the hippo skull. You can see over there, on, right on top. And the interesting thing with the hippo, and if they are lying in the water, the ears, the eyes, and the nostrils are all above water. And the reason for that with the ears and eyes and nostrils all on top of the head is so that they can lie in deeper water, so cover their whole body and or uh, submerge the whole body underwater and keep all the vital organs that they need, all their sense organs above the water so they can keep an eye out for any danger. So the ears, the eyes and the nostrils. Oh, those little birds are bothering so Landon, the hippo is only hiding in the water at the moment because of the hot, hot day. They don't like the sun very much and they prefer to stay cool. So they, um, they do enjoy lying in the water just to stay cool. It's not a case of them really trying to hide. Although they are big animals and they can be a little shy. So even though in the evenings, and that's the best time, or in winter, it's the best time to see them out of the water when it's very cool and it's not so hot and they'll move around feeding on grass in his nostrils. So Brennan, the water doesn't actually camouflage the hippo. The water is just there as a place for the hippo to hide in or to rest in because it's cooler. So it doesn't necessarily camouflage the hippo at all. Jewel, these hippo are not related to rhinos at all. You wanted to know if they're related in any way. They're not. Hippos are in a different family completely. They're not related to the rhino at all. The rhino is much, much bigger. Uh, or actually, some of the rhino, uh, some species of rhino, are about the same size as a hippo. Um, but, uh, but the rhinos obviously have those beautiful big horns, and the rhinos don't lie in the water all day like hippos do. But they are different animals completely. Not related. Um, I think we're going to sit here a little bit longer with this hippo to see what he gets up to. Let's head back to Brent with the leopards and see what they're doing. Well, here we go. They're just exploring around this area where their mom left them. And that's normal. I can't see where the little boy is. That's the little girl we're following there now. I wonder where her brother's hiding. He's around there somewhere. Oh, she you might. Has she spotted him? She's just looking for him. And you can see that little white tip to the tail. Now, all leopards have that. It's called a following mechanism. So, when babies are following their mom, they can see that white tip and follow her. Okay, now, they've got to a difficult spot. I'm gonna have to try and move around. Wait, is she gonna pop out again? We just wanna wait one minute, have a quick look. One second, maybe not one minute. One minute's a bit long. I just wanna see if she's gonna come down off and joining us again. So, so far, your guys, your questions have been great. Keep them coming. We love hearing from you. Okay, now we're gonna move. See if we can get a nice view of her again. We don't want to fall into the hole. No, we're not going to fall into the hole. Don't worry. Okay, 
let's see if we can get a view of these wonderful leopards. Can you see it? Or him? Oh look, there they are. There he is. Lying down right there next to the other game drive car. And uh, it's been so wonderful having Malibu, Torwood and Providence Elementary with us on the school drive. Guys, it's been absolutely splendid, but it's time to say goodbye. Hopefully we'll see you on drive again soon. So from all of us here at Safari Live, toodaloo for now. So he's still sitting with the hippo, everyone, and I think the schools have just left us. Um, we're not going to sit with this hippo for too much longer, but interesting behavior and interesting to see these ox peckers all sitting on the hippo, feeding on the, they're actually feeding on the blood. And, um, and that's what ox peckers do, is they, and that's why they also feed on ticks, is mainly to get to the blood. So that ox pecker and those ox peckers are actually cleaning the wound or drinking the blood of the hippo. That's why they're sitting on that hippo and why they've been um, flying about. And all there have been a few of them on that hippo, in fact. There have also been little terrapins swimming around and trying to bite ticks in that or feed on the ticks off of the hippo. And there are plenty of terrapins in that water at the moment. You might see there. Look at all those heads bobbing in and out. They are plenty of terrapins here, it's incredible. I think because it's so dry, there's not a lot of water around, so they need to all congregate in these little mud wallows or dams. And um, I mean, this is very dry at the moment. Hopefully we're gonna get some rain soon, but the terrapins will also go and feed off ticks off of, those, off of that hippo. Anyway, it was lovely to sit with them. We're going to start moving again. I'm trying to find out if uh, Herbert and them have had any luck with the lions. I, I haven't heard anything from him. Um, I'm hoping that they do find them because they are looking for them. We did a, a loop around and tried to look for tracks, but it's very difficult to drive and look for tracks, especially if they've just crossed the road somewhere. Um, but... Uh, no sign of them just yet. Well, we haven't had a sign of them, so I'm hoping Herbert and them do have a bit more luck. And nice to see that zebra briefly that walked through here. I don't know where it's gone, where it's gone to. Move through here. We might see it again while we're driving. Still very, very warm. So, and I do think that if these uh, if these lions are around, they'll still be resting in the shade. And um, now that the schools have left us, you know, please don't forget, you can send us your questions and your comments, either via Twitter, the hashtag Safari Live, otherwise email us questions at wildearth.tv. And we'll gladly answer your questions and, and listen to your comments. We love having our, our viewers comment and, and um, send in your questions. Hopefully everybody gets to learn from it. A little steenbok. Hopefully it doesn't run. Oh, no, there it goes. <laughs> As I said, that, that. Hang on, maybe if I go forward a little bit, you might get a view through there. How's that view? Can you see it? A beautiful little male steenbok. One of the smallest antelope in this area. Lovely to see them around. There are quite a few. A little shy, as you saw. He didn't want to stand around or close to us for very long. They're dropping some dung there, it looks like, yeah. Um, and these little stone box do have little middens that they'll use. Um, or what they occasionally do, because they are quite territorial, or what they occasionally do, and we might see this male, he might try and cover that dung. Let's just see if he does that. Let's just have a have a look. There, you see that? Covering his dung? 
They're very interesting, very secretive little animals, and they try and cover their dung. Uh, and I mean, there are a few theories. And the theory is that if they scent marking, perhaps scratching soil makes the scent last a little bit longer. But I think mainly with these little Stirnbok, is they do try and hide some of their dung um, so that predators don't pick up um, that they are in the area. So they try and cover their dung and mask the scent a little bit more than anything else. Very interesting behavior. Hmm, lovely to see the little steenbok. Let me just see if I can get hold of Herbert quickly. Herbert, Herbert for Byron. You can try to find out, get an update where they are looking. And if they want us to have a look in an area, it does help if we work together and try and check a larger area we might be able to find the lions a lot quicker then oh, a female stenbok just ran past us and I, I assume that that female might be the mate of that male that we had because they are or well, they do generally stay in pairs um, I should just move through the thicket there a little bit. You can't see her now, but um, they do stay in pairs. Not always right. And I, oh, sorry, something bit me. <laughs> I think it was a little fly. <laughs> yeah. um, so, as I was saying, before I was attacked viciously by a fly, they stay in pairs, and that, and they don't. Not always in the same, um, or, or very, very close to one another. Rather, they will be in the same area, but not right next to one another they do split up a little bit and then they'll meet up occasionally but uh, they do stay in pairs and they generally mate for life which is interesting uh, considering all other antelope or most other antelope um, will mate with many different partners all right we're going to continue our search for lions and let's see if jamie has had any luck on foot We have had lots of luck and by no small means due to Herbie's assistance in terms of keeping ahead of us and helping us out in looking for the tracks. Now we're going to talk about that particular track in a moment but I'm starting to feel slightly hurried because we are on a main road. But just a quick reintroduction for those of you who are joining us now after the school drives are complete. My name is Jamie. This afternoon Jean Ray is on camera with him. You will know him of course from the spectacular backward swan dive that he did over a termite mound earlier. You'll be happy to know that he is in one piece. Um, dignity not so intact, sort of intact. Yeah, Jandre is quite happy about it. He's he's absolutely fine. My, minor graze, but other than that, he is alive and well. I'm terribly impressed at his dedication to the camera that he didn't send it flying. But if perhaps you have any further questions on Jandre's not fall from grace, but just backwards fall, go away, flies. You can send those through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And likewise, any questions that you happen to think of about lions, leopards, or anything in between, or perhaps the stable flies that are attempting to sink their biting mouth parts into our flesh. So our lion track is over here. My shadow, unfortunately, is going to make life very difficult. But it does give you a nice idea. The outline of the track, these are the toes here and this is the back of the foot. So in terms of size, it is roughly the same size as my hand. If I don't stretch my fingers out, his track is roughly the size of my hand track. So I'm absolutely massive, almost side plate sized track. And he is slowly but surely work walking in a circle, which I can't quite understand. We're about, I would say mm, 300, 400 meters from where we first picked up on those tracks. And just by the way, this morning, we were on our way home after the end of the sunrise safari. And I don't know what it is with me on this road and animals at the end, but we walked straight into Amber Eyes and Mfumo who watched us for a little while and then got up and trotted off in the opposite direction. So it's them that we've been tracking. So we know exactly when they were, where they were, and what... Ooh, that's an interesting... Sorry, I say it's interesting. Watch out, don't stand in the genre. <laughs> we're all going backwards. Sorry, this is not belonging to a lion, obviously, um, but it is a relatively large deposit of one of the bird species. And I'm trying to work out what it is from the tracks. I mean, surely that is too big for a Franklin. 
His Franklin tracks here, but it is, is it, is it, Herbie? It is. So that is a Franklin deposit. I'm actually quite astounded at the sheer disproportionate size of it. But it does tell us something as gross as it is to look at. And that is, of course, that much like reptiles, birds do not urinate. They do not have a separate sort of, um, they don't actually have separate reproductive and urinary tract openings. It's all one opening known as the cloaca, much like reptiles, because, of course, birds and reptiles quite closely rela related. And this white stuff here, is that I'm not going to touch because it's very fresh. But this white stuff here is the urea. So we excrete urea in our urine and in our sweat. Um, birds will excrete it in a very solid form um, as part of their entire excretory substance. So they defecate and urinate as one. Our lion tracks, moving swiftly on from what is this bird droppings, our lion tracks come along down here. They go on top of most of the tracks of the vehicles along here. And you'll notice us all do that, by the way, when we track. It's a habit we've all got, marking with the back of our, with our toes behind us, just so that if we do lose the track, we've got a really easy way of coming back to the track, or else an easy way of somebody else spotting the track. So here, you can see we've already been walking around here. Here he goes. And unfortunately, or for, well, no, it's unfortunate, actually. Unfortunately, they're going straight into the block that we were in this morning, which is where we didn't have any signal on bushwalk a little bit, uh, oh, yes, this morning on bushwalk. So what we're going to try and do, because there's a, there is a patch that, uh, there's a strip that we do have signal, we're going to try and follow them in there a little bit, and then obviously once our signal starts to drop, then we'll have to turn around and head back to the more comfortable, say, the more comfortable signal areas. Which is such a pity, because it would have been so, so nice to start making our way in there. But unfortunately, we just, we can't, we won't be able to have any pictures. So we'll end up in a situation where we find the lions, but we won't be able to talk to you. I just want to move off the road because there is a vehicle coming. And then we shall see what else we can find. We identified the tree from this morning, the tree that unfortunately we couldn't show you because we were in the spot without signal. And it was a rus. It was, a, it was one of the species of rus of which there are many. I'm just no, I'm just waving hello because we've just come off the main road. I'm just checking to see which way these lions have gone. While we do that, let's go over to Byron, who's found some of the Inkahuma's favorite food. Well, we have indeed, and we were chatting this morning about us not seeing too many buffalo around. Um, but here is an old buffalo bull. And he is still very, very thin after the drought. And you would have thought that he'd start picking up a bit of fat and condition. But uh, I suppose there's still not a lot of grass around. And I mean, it does look green, but it's not substantial to keep these animals going and, uh, and feeding on a lot of vegetation. But they'll, they're trying their best. So hopefully, hopefully they'll all start picking up uh, some weight fairly, fairly soon. Nice to see a buffalo there. And um, I'm not sure, I mean, I've just been listening to Jamie and Herbert. No real sign. I know they've got tracks, but we're not exactly sure which direction these lines have gone. And it's a bit confusing. Sounds like they've gone back in uh, the opposite direction to what they were going. So um, we'll, uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to head towards that position where we had Tingana this morning, that big male leopard. I'm going to go and have a look and see what's happening there, if he's still around. Um, I was hoping to find the lions a bit earlier, but what we can do is go and have a look and see if that leopard's in the area. Maybe we're lucky in ears and we get a view of him. And then we can always come back and try to look for those lions a bit later. Maybe as it cools down, we might get them moving around. So I think that sounds like a good plan. So it's still very, very warm. So 
I do think if that male leopard is still in that area, it's probably lying in that drainage line, trying to stay out of the heat. James, you say it was nice to see a live buffalo or breathing buffalo for a change. And it was indeed nice to see a buffalo that's not being fed on by lions or just a dead carcass. Really nice driving, a little bit quicker, got a nice breeze, cools everything down a bit, which is great. It's still no sign of elephants, and it's uh, very, very unfortunate. I'm hoping that we get to see some elephants soon. I think I mentioned it this morning and start missing them. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear the name there properly. It's a bit loud here at the moment, but uh, <laughs> it sounds like Espen. Espen wants to know why are male buffalo known as Dugger Boys? So, Espen, well, the reason is the old male buffalo like to wallow in the mud fairly regularly, and uh, and the Zulu word for mud is umdaga. And uh, what happened was because these males have been found wallowing in mud and lying in these water holes constantly, they got the nickname Dugger Boys because they generally just like the mud very much and often get caked in the mud and that's to protect their skin, stay cool and keep some of the ticks and, and uh, flies off of them. So that's where the name Dugger comes from, um, Dugger Boys because they generally always in the mud, so Mud Boys. So that's. That's where that name comes from. I'm going to try to turn on to Arethusa now. Um, I'll just wait for a vehicle to pass. Afternoon everyone. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Enjoy. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, where's the cooler? Um, I think somewhere around Mamba Road, yeah, um, so on our side, Mamba Road, um, somewhere through the drainage line there, eh? I think not far from Cheetah Cut Line area. Oh, she is, she's got, she's got a bumper there. Uh, nothing at the moment. Maybe she's back to the south now. Maybe she's heading back there, yeah. Uh, uh, they were in that area, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, enjoy. Yeah. Enjoy everyone, enjoy your drive, bye-bye. <laughs> Sorry about that everyone, just trying to update some of the other rangers in the area with what's going on with leopards and uh, they're obviously always on the lookout for leopards, especially Karula and her cubs. Hornbill, uh, hang on, Let me just reverse for you a little bit. There we go. Yellow billed hornbill, has it got a worm? Yes, it has. <laughs> As we focus, it flies off. Looked like a little caterpillar, perhaps. The hornbills do enjoy feeding on caterpillars, these hairy caterpillars that we get in this area, especially they sit on these terminalia trees quite a lot. And these are the um, silver cluster leaves all over to my left. You can actually see they do have a silver tinge to them, a bit of silver coloration. And they do get a lot of caterpillars sitting on them. And those hornbills do go and look for those little caterpillars. Uh, 
James Duncan, you want to know, is there any type of plant here that we can use to help soothe um, itchy skin or irritated skin? Now, I'm trying, trying to think. Sorry, I, um, I actually want to take another road. I don't want to go down here. I'm going to head straight towards Red Dam on Arethusa, rather. Um, now, I'm trying to think if there is a tree that soothes itchy skin out here. Oh dear, I can't think of one now. Um, uh, no, I'm stumped. I can't think of one, James. I'm not sure. I'll have to try and find out for you. Yeah, really, I can't think of one that soothes itchy skin. We're going to be approaching Red Dam soon. Um, I just want to quickly have a look. It's just, uh, we're not far from the dam. Let's quickly have a look and see if there's anything drinking, perhaps, around the water. And have a good look around this area. I wonder if that male leopard didn't perhaps decide to go for a drink today because it was hot, because he was feeding on... Uh, on an impala sometimes they get very thirsty when they do feed on a kill and they will go in search of water We're approaching the dam now it's just off to our right let's have a look around and see if there's any animals if there are any animals in this area and Nothing, unfortunately. A few terrapins that just moved off. Oh, there's some beautiful little birds flying around here. Let's have a look. Oh, a pygmy kingfisher. Yes, look at that. A beautiful pygmy kingfisher. Let me... Um, Sorry, uh, sorry. I think it's a malachite kingfisher. My bad. Hold on. Let's just have a look. There it goes. No, that's not it. That's a flycatcher. But the kingfisher is down here. It's sitting. See that dead branch there, Vian? Beautiful malachite kingfisher. I'm sorry, not uh, a little bit higher off, hanging off the edge of the, the bank, Vian, just under that green grass over there. There we go. There it is. Wonderful. Beautiful malachite kingfisher, wow. Just caught the glimpse of that deep blue, almost purple coloration. I haven't seen one of these in this area before. I know Brent, um, I think, saw one or two the other day. And it's a beautiful little kingfisher, tiny kingfisher. One of the smaller ones, and they do feed on um, on fish. Tiny little fish and tadpoles, um, little frogs perhaps. Sometimes the odd insect, but they are generally found around water. They're very seldomly found away from water holes. So it's really wonderful to see um, to see this. Uh, Little um, little kingfisher, the smallest kingfisher that we do have in this area. And there's another one, the pygmy kingfisher, but I don't think we see many of them around. Just trying to have a look. There's some swallows coming down, having a drink. Those look like red-breasted swallows. Um, oh, it's a wonderful waterhole, this. A lot of activity. We've got the blacksmith lapwings drinking over there too and uh, what is that a little wood sandpiper just in front of that uh, or oh, where did it go is it still there there he is wood sandpiper oh 
a lot of a lot of bird life around here. It's fantastic. All right, I think what we're going to do is we're going to continue on and have a look if we can find out where that male leopard is, if it's still in the area or if it's moved. I think why don't we head back to Brent and get an update from him and his leopards that he was with. Well, welcome back. We just went for a little trundle to see if we Karula didn't just sleep somewhere in, in the shade away from the cubs. It's not. Her track's actually heading to the north, so she's off hunting again. And I'm not going to try to go find her because it'd literally be like looking for a needle in a haystack. So I think our best bet is to stay with young Shungeli and Hosanna, who are quite flat at the moment. Oh, there's one. Where's the other gone while we've been gone? So... Where's the other trouble? Ah, it's gone behind there. But there we go. We still little Shungi there, still sleeping in the shade. Hassan has gone on a wonder somewhere. And it is quite warm today, so it's not unusual for the leopards not to be very active. Now, interestingly enough, Karula has gone off hunting. Now, she does hunt quite a lot in the heat. Let's see how long it takes for before little Shongi gets lonely again and goes to look for her brother. Sleepy, sleepy kitties. Now, this is live, so we can't predict what's going to happen next. There could be a flurry of action, or they could just keep sleeping. Now, that is the joy of being live. And remember, this is also interactive. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or questions at wildearth.tv. If you'd like to ask us any questions about these incredible cats, or even just this area in general. Uh, Tanith would like to know what language is the, are the leopards named in? Uh, they're named in Shitsonga, uh, or sometimes called Shangan. It is the local language in this part of South Africa, in the sort of northeastern areas along the border of Mozambique. And the language extends into both Mozambique and South Africa. And uh, tons of slacks know how many languages I, I speak. Well, uh, I speak quite a few badly, Tanth, but uh, well, I probably English, Afrikaans, a bit of Zulu. My uh, Shangan is not very good, uh, barely possible, in fact, and uh, some Swahili. Um, and that's about what I can really get by, and I can also get by a little bit in uh, Tswana and Sutu, but again, not very well. Bavokile, and Bavokile is wondering, is it's safe for Karula to just leave her cubs by themselves, or is there any danger? I mean, there's always danger, Bavokile. We are out in the African bush. A lion could wander in, a, a leopard could, a male leopard who's unrelated to them, a young nomadic male might wander in. But if she doesn't go out hunting, they would certainly die because they wouldn't get any food. And to take them hunting is a, is a big problem. Is, uh, sh they're often boisterous when they're moving and they, they chase all the potential dinner species away. So it's as safe as it can be um, for them to be left in the area like this. There's lots of good hiding spots and climbable trees. And uh, even at this age, they are quite alert. Now, 
Paul's wondering why don't leopards hyperventilate to cool off? Well, Paul, in hyperventilation, you would actually increase your heart rate, so it would actually have the opposite effect <laughs> from cooling off. It would actually heat them up. And of course, there is danger of passing out when you hyperventilate too much, etc. And and they haven't developed it. They don't. They don't have a need to hyperventilate. So they're quite happy just panting and lying in the shade and minimising their movements to avoid overheating. But. While we sit with a very warm little Shongile, hopefully Hosanna makes his way back just now. But let's go find out how Jamie's lion tracking is going. Well, have a look at what we have found wrapped around the branch of this tree. Now, I have absolutely no idea what it is we're looking at. I haven't got a clue. I've been trying to work it out. I don't think, let me try and go around so that I don't hide it away in my shadow. I've been trying to work this out. I don't think it is a reptile, I mean, a, a, what are the words I'm looking for? Insect species. I don't think it's a wasp or something like that. It's definitely an egg casing. But as to what it is, I am utterly bemused. It doesn't make sense for a reptile to leave its eggs right out in the open like this. So it must surely be an insect, but I can't think it's got a very egg-like shell to them. They're hard and, and sort of solid and crispy. So I have absolutely no idea what they are. So what I'm going to do, because they've all hatched, or they've all been eaten, they're all broken open either ways, I'm going to try and take this branch. It's such a pity it's, ow, um, oh dear, one down, where'd it go? Oh no, it didn't, it didn't. I thought I'd broken it, but I hadn't. I'm going to take this branch of the black monkey thorn and I'm going to take it back to the tent so that James can have a look at it and maybe Steph can have a look at it. Alarm calling and I know the lions and I know we can't go there. But we have a drive channel so they will be able to follow up. And we're going to follow up on what this is. Let me try and find a safe place for it. This seems like a bad idea, but anyway, there's no way that could go wrong at all. Now, James Dungan, I hear that you've been asking about itchy skin and whether there's any plants that will help you out. This is one plant. I'm not going to take you over there because it puts us further into the bad signal area, but it's called a Bushman's grape. Now, I don't know if it works for itchy skin, but I'm going to try something. I'm going to try an experiment because remember, get bitten. Well, I did, and there's a couple of different remedies for itchy skin. One is the Bushman's grape, which is actually not good for bee stings, but I'm thinking bee stings, tick bite, might work the same. Then there's marula bark, and then herby. Welcome back. It seems like Jamie's in a bit of a gremlin area. Uh, we're still sitting here. Yeah. Osana and Shungi, they haven't really moved, they're flat, flat cats. And uh, oh, Karula's off hunting, and we know where the cubs are. So I'm going to put it up to you guys. Should we go see what else we can find on this sunny Monday afternoon? Or should we sit here and wait to see if Karula comes back? Now, there's always a chance we might bump Karula somewhere on our wanderings. She, I got a general idea where she was heading. She was hunting towards Mumba Road. So we might take a, a double around there. She might head down to the Mawati. But it's up to you guys. Let me know. Do you want to stay here uh, or do you want to move on? And we're going to just put the hashtag Safari Live on should we stay or should we go? I don't think there's going to be too much action. We can come back and check in here a little later, uh, but I think it's pretty much going to be flat cats for the next hour or so. Remember, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv. While we're sitting here with a flat cat, let's have a look at a tree or two. Now, Let's have a look at this tree that's right next to us. Let's get you a little leaf here. There we go, I'm gonna pop it on the dashboard for you. So, who knows what tree this is? Actually, I'm gonna tell you what tree this is. So it's quite a difficult one, just from the, where it's growing and the way it's growing. It doesn't look quite normal. So what it does, and you can see, there's a very new 
growth on the leaves and there's some very fine hair on it. There we go, you can see the little fine hairs catching the sunlight as I move it from side to side Ooh, to there. Okay. So it is one of the bush willows, the combretums, and this one looks like a russet bush willow that's just got a nice new flush of new leaves. And uh, of course, a lot of a lot of the trees have just got a flush of new leaves, and it's been really, really dry. I mean, the worst drought experienced in over a hundred years. And uh, hopefully, we get some more rain because. The amount of rain we've had so far has been great, but it's not nearly enough to sort of counteract the, the, the lack of rain we had in the last wet season. Shongi not moving an inch. Little Hassan is somewhere just over there. Uh, let's see what else is around the vehicle. Mm. What else can we spot from here while we wait to see whether we're going to stay or going to go? Hmm. Okay, well we can have a look at this. Have a look at this root system here quickly uh, before we move on. It seems like everyone wants to go see what else we can find. We'll come back and check on the leopards a little later. There we go. There's a red bush willow that's been pushed over by elephants. But quite interesting, you can see there's almost two separate sets of roots when we look at the bottom. So the left hand side already died, and the right hand side kept living. So look at that. So there we go. There's the living roots. And that's what the elephants are mostly after when they push a tree down like that. They will feed off the branches, but they generally do go for the roots. And where we can see on the left there, a completely dead side, and the termites have started eating it. Okay, well, let's go see what else we can find as we travel through the African wilderness. And I've got some good news, because Byron's got another leopard. We do indeed, and this leopard is far from flat, everyone. He is up in the tree feeding at the moment. Look at that. And our plan worked out. We thought we'd head into this area a little bit later. Hopefully, hopefully it cooled down a bit. And it has somewhat. It's fortunately quite dry in the drainage line. I mean, quite cool in the drainage line. So this leopard is trying to feed on that carcass. A lot of flies around there, as you can see bothering him quite a bit but he's trying to finish that and I do think that he's going to finish that fairly soon it didn't seem like a lot of meat left and when we arrived here there was a hyena that was milling about underneath the tree and got one or two tasty little bits that fell from the carcass but that hyena's taken that little piece and hang on here it comes off to the left you'll see the hyena coming in there we go. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> it's trying to scavenge little pieces that the leopards fall and dropping from the tree. Oh, there's a piece that fell, but it landed in a bush. <laughs> so the hyena won't be able to get it. And that's great. You know, I actually, um, I haven't seen a hyena for, the, for gee, how long now? Um, a month, yeah. And they're around, we hear them and we hear, see their tracks, but we just don't see them very often. It's great to see this hyena trying to scavenge bits and pieces from this leopard. And it's amazing how agile that leopard is, but look at that, isn't that wonderful? And these flies, oh, oh, watch, he might try and get that piece in the tree, let's see. <laughs> Let's see this. He might try and. I mean, they. So they can't climb or jump very, very well. Um, he might just try and. Like we can see, they get on his hind legs, try to reach up and get that. That must be so frustrating. <laughs> Giving us a little look and saying, don't laugh at me. Oh, those flies are really bothering these animals. <laughs> he 
imagine that dangling this piece of meat in front of the hyena and he can't get to it. It must be so frustrating. And look how agile this leopard is. This big male leopard. I mean, Tingana is huge. And the way he's able to move around in this Tamburti tree and feed and balance, it is really incredible. See, we'll probably use that tail quite a lot. His tails are very, very thick. I help balance. Very powerful tails. I'll balance the leopard slightly. Also try to keep some of the flies away. Oh, this is great. This, uh, to be honest, a leopard sighting like this doesn't get much better. To be able to see it up in the tree feeding, doing what a leopard is meant to do. You know, we, we hear um, stories of leopards hoisting kills into trees and feeding in trees and you don't often see it. So be able to see it now is wonderful. Oh, watch. Let's see what happens if he's going to come down. See, that hyena is very nervous. He knows this is a big, big leopard. And let's see. The, I th we might get some really interesting interaction here. Let's see what this male decides. And that hyena looked a little, little young, not quite a big adult. Um, and also what happens is if hyenas are alone, then chances are they won't challenge a big male leopard like this. A leopard will easily chase this hyena off. But if they outnumber the leopard quite a bit, like maybe two or three hyena, then they'll potentially try and chase the leopard away but with the leopard being up in the tree it's completely safe at the moment it doesn't have to worry about anything also the, the hyena obviously can't get up into the tree so that kill is safe or what's left of the kill and um, it'll be interesting to see what this leopard does Raj, as I was saying, it's, you know, these leopards generally try to avoid confrontation. So the chances of him fighting with this hyena are very, very slim. But he would most likely chase the hyena away very easily. That hyena, I mean, you could see just when that, oh, look at that. Wow, look how agile he is. Incredible how he can just jump and turn through the, th the thick branches of this tree. It really is incredible. But um, so it's no, there's, it's highly unlikely that this leopard would actually fight the hyena, but he would probably chase him off, and um, and I think a growl or a hiss would be enough to get that hyena to move away. You saw as he moved and tried to come down or move slightly further down, the hyena got a fright and it did move away. He doesn't want to necessarily tackle a big, strong male leopard like this. David, you've asked an interesting question about the hyenas and do they normally roam on their own? So David, the hyenas are, on, are found in clans usually. So the clans can be fairly large, but often what happens is the hyenas do move around and scavenge, especially in these areas. They do move around alone and scavenge. It's easier then to try and find food. And they don't have to share food with some of the other animals around this area. Oh, another piece just fell. I wonder if that hyena will want to come through. Don't see it anymore. So, David, so as I was saying, with them moving around, scavenging by themselves, it's easier to find food. They don't have to share it with anyone else. And they can then scavenge and move off. Um, but if they find large carcasses, often they'll call and communicate with each other. And then you will find a clan arriving together and trying to feed and scavenge off a big carcass and especially if there's perhaps a large um, pride of lions then if the hyenas do outnumber the lions especially if they're lionesses the hyenas will be able to chase the lions off and um, if there are males around usually the hyenas try to avoid the area because the males are so much bigger and stronger here comes a male let's see let's see if he comes down there we go oh look at that it's probably going to take one or two steps and then jump oh which way is he going to want to go? I do think if he does want to climb down, he potentially will want to climb this way. There we go. Let's see. 
exactly perfect wasn't that a great dismount <laughs> 10 out of 10 tingana and i think he might may just go and lay down in the shade somewhere and he's hoisted that kill high up in the tree let's see where he goes wasn't that a wonderful sighting lovely we'll try to follow him and just see where he does move to I don't think he's going to move too far perhaps he's just a bit hesitant to to stay close to the tree all right I'm gonna see if I can back to the bushwalk to Jamie and get an update from her We were in the process of trying to answer a question a little bit earlier. I don't know how much you saw because I don't know exactly where it was that our signal disappeared. However, I would like to finish off with what we started talking about. Apparently, I should start from the beginning, which is a very good place to start. So the beginning of the, well, a little bit of the walk earlier that we had to crash cut away from was the mystery of the eggs on some kind of, or on a black monkey orange. And I have absolutely let me just turn them around so you can see them and you can see in a little bit I have absolutely no idea what these things are so I've taken them along for the ride just to try and figure out if we can't get some answers on this subject because I don't think that they're an insect egg I think they might be a reptile egg but they seem to be very very exposed where they were so I've been carrying this around so far I've managed to hook it into my skin once and drop it three times and hopefully it manages to actually get home intact <laughs> it's quite difficult you're sort of absent-mindedly swinging whatever it is you're carrying and I nearly forgot all about it. Right, the next thing I was going to go into, I don't want to put this in my pocket because I've already dropped, I'll just hold it. Um, the next thing I'm going to go into was James Dungan's question about whether or not there are any plants for itchy skin. And I thought we'd do a little bit of an experiment. So I picked up some panicum grass, which is apparently, according to Herbie, the one of the remedies for itchy skin. Then I picked up some very droopy looking Bushman's grape already very droopy despite the fact that I picked it earlier and I've picked them now just so that we don't run the risk of not finding them again with where we're walking and I'm now on a mission to try and find some marula tree bark which has purported is purported to have antihistamine properties now my plan is and I'm afraid I might have to sit down for this my plan is to do a control test because I got bitten by pepper ticks the last time I was on a walk which are the larval form of a tick they're horrible tiny little ticks and they bite just as well as the adults except you can't see them to get them off so I got a few bites from a tip pepper tick and I'm going to try and do a controlled test to see whether or not any of these work the Bushman's grape is the one I'm going to start with this is the one I'm the least certain of because it is the one that is actually not really for tick bites it's the tick bite there you can see I've already masked it with my fingernails obviously not the kind of person that can deal with an itch and not scratch it so i've been told according to renius who came to teach us tracking that the bees oh, the bees the leaves can be used for bee stings so you pack it on you rub it on and it can be used for bee sting so i'm going to try I needed to sort of, I don't know, needed to tie on somehow, I suppose. Did it? There we go. You just stick there. It's very sticky, very, very sticky leaf. I've just chewed it a little bit just to give it some moisture. Then I've got another bite over here that I'm going to put some grass on. Just bear with me a second. I'm going to give it a chew. Mm. Some panicum grass. Okay, that was maybe slightly overkill. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have another bite on my toe that is awaiting marula bark. Oh, whoopsie. Oh, dear. Ow, this one's stinging. <laughs> the Bushman's grape stings. I don't know whether that means I should probably take it off or not. Oh, well. 
We'll see. It's an experiment. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a control. Well, I do actually have a control. I suppose I could use the one pepper tick bite that's on my stomach as a control to see which one works the best. So we're doing a test between Bushman's grape, panicum grass, and when we get some, some marula tree bark to see which of them works better for an itch. So I hope one of them will work well. And then I will have an answer. Oh, that was never going to stay on. Wait, before I forget, where did I put it? There. Hopefully we will have an answer as to which of the traditional itchy skin methods is more effective in terms of treating things like itchy bites from ticks. Marula tree bark, unfortunately, is going to take me a little bit longer because we've got to try and find... Ow, that stings. I might have done a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> this might have been a very silly experiment. <laughs> it's not itching though. So far the Bushman grape is the winner. <laughs> it is not... <laughs> it's not, um, it's not itching anymore. So, so far the Bushman grape is the winner. Apparently, James, you're very appreciative because it's not often you get an answer and a demonstration. Well, I'm glad we can demonstrate. I'll let you know which of these works the best. I can't quite decide. So far the sting is more distracting than the itch, but that I suppose is a good thing. And the one that's on my foot is still itching like crazy. So let's go and find us some marula tree. It will take us a little bit longer because we've actually got to find a suitable living marula that isn't too big and try and find, try and get to some of the bark, which might prove a little bit more tricky. So we've managed to, we're unfortunately moving away from the lions, we're moving through the silver cluster leaf thicket. And while we go off in search of our marula tree to complete the third and final portion of our test, it sounds as though Brent has found one of our bird species. A gorgeous, gorgeous little pearl spotted owlet. Now, look there, you can see those very yellow eyes, those big eyes that are designed for the dark. Now, look, there we go, he's got fake eyes on the back of his head. Look at that. Gorgeous, gorgeous little predator. Now, that is one of the smallest owlets we get. And the barred owlet is a little bit bigger. The scops is the smallest. There we go, pearl spotted owlet. They are, we see them actually relatively often during the day. What happens is they get chased by lots of different birds, especially drongos, things like that. And it forces them out of their daytime roosts. So there we go. An incredible little bird. And with those incredible fake eyes on the back of his head. Just in case you try to creep up on him. Uh, he, it looks like he's looking both ways. Now they're incredibly territorial owls. And they're monogamous. They also defend their territory quite violently against other pearl spotted owlets. And their average territory is quite small, uh, depending on where you are in this part of the world. It's about 60 to 100 hectares, so about 200, 200 acres. They generally use whole, old holes that might have been excavated by woodpeckers or other birds, or occasionally, less often, they'll use natural cavities from where a branch or something has fallen off. Now, of course, being such a little predatory bird, they actually have massive competition for nesting sites with birds like starlings, barbets, hornbills. And they will align their nest with leaves to make it more comfortable for the female when she's in there. And they don't live for too long, but uh, during their breeding activity, they'll use the same nest site for up to four years if they can, if they're not kicked out by another bird species. Now, after the, the, the chicks are fledged, for about two weeks they stay very, very close to their original nest sites, generally in some thick bushes, and for two weeks the parents will continue 
to feed the chicks and even even though they probably are capable of hunting for themselves by that stage now they don't often sit this still for this long Heidi says she didn't know that owls had feathers on their legs too. Well, they do almost all of them, actually, except for the fishing owls. Uh, they are the only owl species that has featherless legs. And in South Africa, we only get one species of fishing owl, the Powell's fishing owl. Further north in Africa, you do get Rufus fishing owls as well. But normally they don't sit, the kitten. Uh, come on, pop into the sunlight or sun drop so we can get that gorgeous little owl in the light. So as we mentioned when we first spotted the owl, that they are completely monogamous, they do mate for life. And they also use the same nesting site for up to four years. Uh, My World, Your Music was wondering that. So yes, they are monogamous, they do mate for life. Uh, quite a few of the owl species will, will mate for life. You can see doesn't want to be spotted by the resident drongos or starlings that will mob and chase him. They normally start their very exquisite call around sunset. We're not going to do the call this close to a poor pearl spotted owlet. As I said, they're incredibly territorial. So they get quite angry when you imitate their calls close by. They think there's an invader coming. Wonderful big yellow eyes. Off he goes, oh, he's in the light. Let's see if we can grab him. He's landed in the light up there. Oh, there we go, the Drongo's found him. Oh, shame, now he's gonna get attacked. See, that's just talking about the mobbing behavior of other birds. So he's trying to get deeper into that knob thorn where the Drongo can't get to him. The Drongo is sitting off to the left. It's just stay on the owl because he's he might take off. There we go, here comes the drongo. He can't just get to that owl's in a great spot. Quite well protected. There we go, you can see the drongo. Trying to attack that pearl spotted owlet, trying to move him along. Drongos really don't like other predatory birds in the areas they, they are. They'll attack every predator from a pearl spotted owlet to a massive martial eagle. These poor little owls spend a lot of their life being chased by other birds. That's what happens when you're not very big. Let me just try and roll forward slightly. Let's see, see if we can get a better gap. There we go. Can you hear that of the drongo? Such pretty little owls. Look at them watching that drongo head side to side. Oh, has the drongo given up? That's unusual. Oh. Oh. He's calling. Has he spotted a competitor? Are we going to see a pearl spotted owlet battle? Where's he going? Where's he going? Oh, 
I can hear another one calling. Are we going to see a daylight owl battle? That would be absolutely fascinating. Just try, I didn't see where exactly where he landed. Oh, there was an African Harrier Hawk, sorry, it just flew off. I can't, no, I didn't see where that owl landed. Pity. But what a wonderful sighting. They don't normally sit still for that long. Uh, remember, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live if you want to ask us a question. And of course, if you don't believe you're live, test me. Test me, I dare you, by using either of those two platforms. So we're going to continue our search for predator. We're going to go look for Karula, uh, who is the mother of those little cubs. And I'm hoping she's hunting through this area. So I'm going to be keeping my eyes on the road, looking for footprints of leopard. While we do that, uh, let's go see uh, what Jamie is up to on foot. Oh, Herbie is going to be helping us out with the acquisition of our marula tree bark in order to figure out our test. But what I've been doing while Herbie's busy with that is I'm looking to see whether or not I can find whatever's been targeting these silver cluster leaves. And something has been targeting them. Just have a look at how they have been munched away. And it's not just in this area, it's all of the silver cluster leaf trees everywhere that have been suffering from some kind of caterpillar infestation. And it's absolutely everywhere. They've been nibbled at, all of them. And if I look here, this one is exactly the same. Nibbled at here. My suspicion, my suspicion is that it is a, sorry, Jandre, my suspicion is that it is a species of the same caterpillar, all targeting, because you usually get the sudden, you get all of these hatchlings coming out together of the same species of moths or butterflies, and they tend to target the, target the same species of trees. So, for example, something like a processionary moth. Now, a processionary moth is called a processionary moth because its caterpillars all walk in a procession so that they look like a stick or a, a snake on the ground. And it's such a pity that we don't see them very often here. In fact, I've never seen them because they're highly entertaining to watch, but they'll always target something like, a, like the raisin bushes of the area. So something specific in terms of caterpillars is right now at this time of year targeting our silver cluster leaves. And I personally don't think it's a very, it's not a plant that I would target if I were a caterpillar. Jandre, you know all about what eating a silver cluster leaf is like. I do too. We're not going to do it on this boiling hot day because our mouths are dry enough. But suffice to say it actually completely removes all of the saliva from your mouth and you actually, it's awful. You end up going So it's not very nice. But it is a host species to a lot of different things. I saw a gall earlier. So a wasp that injects, here we go. Here's a silver cluster leaf gall. That's made by a wasp that injects a growth hormone into the tree along with her egg so that it grows around her egg and creates the perfect casing for her. Oh, there we go. Right, let's go and finish off this experiment because at some point in the not too distant future, uh, we're going to be heading for the safety of home. Thank you, Herbie. Herbie's made a nice little hole, not, uh, not like an elephant hole in the marula tree. And let's add it to the third and final itchy spot. And let's see what we can do. You can see, first of all, it's very, very moist, unbelievably moist. So this is what the elephants are after when they come through and they drive their tusks into the marula tree itself. They're after this cambium layer, which is the tree's way of transporting nutrients up right to the top of the tree in terms of water and then all the way down to the bottom to the roots in terms of food storage. I'm trying to work out what's going to be the best, ooh, tick. There's a not so, sorry, distraction, I know. This is the animal that's been responsible for the itchiness, except the larval stage of this particular tick. I'm not hurting it in any way. I promise you, those of you who've encountered ticks before will know just what resilient little creatures they are. So I'm not hurting it. I'm just holding it nice and steady because they're also very strong. 
Okay, now I'm going to let it go, and it might go very, very quickly. There it goes. Oh, and now it's on Jandre. <laughs> It's not, it's not quite on Jandre. Right, so now we're going to take some of, oh, it's not so easy actually. I'm gonna tear some of these pieces of bark off. I'm trying to get a nice big piece. There we go. And we're going to put it on the third and final itchy point, which is here on my ankle. That's the itchy tick bite. So I'm going to rub it and for good measure, do I just rub it on, Herbie? Yeah. For good measure, I'm going to rub it on where I got a thorn scratch earlier. Oh, look, there's actually a thorn sticking out of the blob of my foot, too. Excuse me. I'm going to rub it where I had an itchy thorn scratch as well. It's very sticky. It's very, very sticky. Now, of all of the cures, this is the one that I have probably the most faith in, just because the marula tree does officially have antihistamine properties in it, or especially in its bark. So there we go, one more giant piece. Now I look as though I've been bleeding profusely, or perhaps I'm very bruised. Let's see which of these works the best. I might take some just in case, just because I have more faith in the Marula tree bark. Right, it sounds as though Byron is still with Tingana, and since I'm going to have to clumsily get my shoes back on, let's go back over to him. And this beautiful male leopard has put on such a wonderful show for us. And while Jamie has been trying to soothe her itches, this male has moved away from the carcass and he's come into this beautiful jackalberry tree. A massive jackalberry and just have a look at where he is lying. Isn't that a fantastic position for this leopard? Um, it's not often you get leopards just going and deciding to lie in the tree and rest. They do on occasion, but uh, this is obviously a nice big tree. Look at his legs. That is the perfect, perfect leopard pose. Legs placed across either side of the branch, tail hanging down. He's probably resting his belly off the side because it's probably full from feeding. And, uh, and now he's just resting. And while he's up there, he's got a lovely vantage point to have a look around to see if there are any other animals in the area. And also, there's a wonderful cool breeze which is blowing through this drainage line and through this area that we are in at the moment. So it's perfect for him up there. It's nice and cool and probably staying away from some of the flies. So just an incredible position for this leopard. And I unfortunately left my camera back at camp, and that's Murphy's Law. When you leave your camera at camp, you often see some really, really great stuff. But that's not a problem because it's just so wonderful to also just enjoy sightings at times. It doesn't mean you always have to take photographs. But just to enjoy and appreciate these sightings, I find is, is just as... Um, beneficial and just as exciting as taking photos of animals in trees or whatever they may do, be doing. It's nice to see this big leopard in, up in this beautiful jackalberry tree. Now there is wonderful light at the moment, however, it's just missing him. He's, he's managed to find a bit of shade. There's some branches in front of him um, off to the right and that's blocking the sun. But if you look in the leaves above him and to, and to the left there's a beautiful golden light coming through at the moment and he's just in the shade and uh, it is a pity if we were serious photographers um, I mean it it would be a bit of a disappointment but like I said to be able to see a leopard up in a tree like this out in the open beautiful view this is a sighting that um, very seldom can be beaten it's just cleaning himself Anissa, and you are five years old, and hello Anissa, it's so nice to have you watching Safari Live with us. Thank you very much for sending your question in. You asked what is my favorite animal, you say yours is the giant panda. And those pandas do look absolutely beautiful, I've never seen one in real life, um, only on documentaries, we don't get them in Africa. Um, but I would say my favorite animal 
is actually an elephant and, he's a, and they are wonderful wonderful animals and fantastic to spend time with them that and actually a honey badger and what I'll do is I'll just show you a picture of a honey badger quickly Anissa so you know what I'm what I'm talking about let me just find one for you quickly there we go just have a look at this that is a little honey badger and that is my favorite animal <laughs> that little guy incredibly tenacious very tough they're not afraid of anything um, but they mainly come out at night so we don't see them very often but they are so cute and they're so wonderful I love them but I haven't seen one for a very long time they are quite rare and then I would say the elephant but to be honest sitting with this beautiful male leopard like this is making me think I wonder if I shouldn't change <laughs> because it is such a wonderful sighting to see this male up in this tree This is often the time of day where we do head off and try to find a, if we do have guests on safari, we head off and try to find a spot to stop for a sundowner and watch the sun go down and have some refreshments. But we would definitely not leave a sighting like this because photographically this is just absolutely beautiful. Okay. It's got a massive head and neck. And it's just looking down. <laughs> this is really, really wonderful. That is a big male leopard. It looks very, very hot, panting. Um, now, now that could be a number of reasons because one is, is hot and then also because of that big belly full belly from all the meat that he's fed on so they do pant quite a lot afterwards when they are full. See, there are still a few flies bothering this leopard. So we're going to spend some more time with this leopard um, and just see what he gets up to. Let's quickly head back to the bushwalk to Jamie. Um, she's going to be heading back to camp soon. Bushwalk team is on their way home and James Dungan, I promise you I'll get back to you on which of the remedies has worked the best for my various itchy tick bite spots and we'll see which what the conclusion is. I, my money's on the marula tree, but who knows. Now just quickly we've got time for one last question. Anessa, you wanted to know what our favourite animals and Anessa is five years old. It's lovely to have your question coming through and thank you. Now apparently yours is a giant panda. Well, Nessa, mine, you want to know ours. Mine is a black rhino, I think, but it's really hard to choose. But if I had to choose one animal, it would be a rhino and it would be the black rhino. Just because they're slightly smaller than the black than the white rhino and they're full of attitude and they do a dance and they're thoroughly entertaining. Jandre says that his favorite animal, although I think he also found it hard to choose, is sharks. And Herbert says his favorite animal is zebra. So there you go, Anessa, you've got an answer from all of the bushwalk team. Right, until we see See you again on the sunrise safari it is time for us to say goodbye the other two vehicles will be out and about but we'll be heading back for the safety and comfort of camp bye bye everybody and i'll see you tomorrow thank you to genre and thank you to all of you bye bye everybody <laughs> Welcome back everyone, as you can see we found some Inyala, it's actually a nice mixed group of animals here, there's Inyala, Impala and baboons, I'm trying to see if we can spot a baboon, now the Impala got to be careful because baboons, big male baboons are quite fond of eating. There's a baboon. 
little one are quite fond of eating baby impala. Big males have been known to hunt and grab baby impala, especially when they're very newborn. I'm just gonna go forward a bit. I think we might get a better view from just on the other side here, but lovely. Now, it's not that uncommon to see those three species together. And uh, it's gonna be interesting because those leopard cubs are not far from here. And I'm quite interested in whether Karula has moved purposely away from where the baboons are. As we know, baboons can pose quite a big threat to young leopards and even an adult female leopard. Uh, a big male baboon's canine is actually longer than a lion's. So I think Karula might have gone a bit, more, a bit further north, which is good, it's deeper into Juma. Okay, let's get down into the riverbed. I want to see if we can get a nice view of those baboons. Look like quite a big troop, at least 30 or 40 of them. Ah, there we go. Just as I was hoping. There'd be some more out in the open. Oopsie, bouncy bounce. I saw some baboons just down here. Are they being camera shy today? Oh, a little bit. There's a big male at the back. Don't disappear around the bush. He's going to. Oh, he's gonna sit down. I'm gonna try and get a little bit further forward so we can see he might move. So far, so good. Oh no, he's not, he's not hanging about. Well, he, he is, he's a baboon, he likes to hang about. Oh, there's another baboon there. There's a female. And you can see her buttocks are enlarged in red, which is one of the indicator signs that she's probably about to come into estrus. And there's the big boy, sitting like an old man. Elbows on his knees. And you can see the size difference between a male and a female. It's like she's presenting to him, uh, showing him that he, she's nearly ready for mating. He's not too interested there. Now, here we go. She's going to do, do a bit of grooming. Now, the baboon hierarchy is actually really interesting. Uh, baboon social structure is run by a group of dominant male, or that's called dog baboons. And they are very violent and very aggressive and to keep order in the rest of the troop. Now, if there's a slight injury to one of those dominant males, the next male down, in the hierarchy chain will attack them brutally to try get that spot on the sort of pounce, council of power. We can hear a black cuckoo calling in the riverbed somewhere. Okay, let me just go try and see if we can get around the front of him. This is quite relaxed. Often the baboons run away from the vehicles. They're quite widespread, these baboons. They spread for about 70 or 80 meters through here. They really do enjoy this. And it's at this time of the day, it's why they're coming towards this type of area. It's the River Rhine area. There's lots of big trees and they'll probably start looking for a place to roost quite soon. And like other primates, us, they know when it gets dark, it's time to get safe. And for them, it's up in a tree. Don't run away, please. We're going so nice and slowly. Oh, 
Oh, we got some more on this side that are up in the open. Oh, one <laughs> city baboons. They were fine while I was moving, but as soon as I stopped, they thought I was had nefarious intent. And we go, little female. Uh, hi, James Dungan. James is wondering, whether the baboons have a set breeding cycle? Or are they like humans? Well, not quite like humans. Uh, only when a female is an estrus will they mate. Uh, but where humans um, sort of mate when they want to. What have you found there, little one? So those are sub-adults. A female is probably just coming into adulthood, probably coming into her first estrus quite soon. There we go, you can see a female a bit older. She's not an estrus. Now, a female that is an estrus, well, we'll try to find you one, has got an incredibly bright red bulbous bottom. Uh, no cowboys yet. Now, quite often, one of the cute things you find with baboons is a baby riding. Oh, someone's getting disciplined. Oh, you can actually... There we go. Where is that one now? Making all the noise just through there. Um, no, a little bit to the left. It's walking that well with my finger. There we go. There's the one causing a bit of trouble there. Got a bit of discipline. Not that one. It was one of the, the young ones, the little ones. Now, Jamie is wondering, do baboons try bite people or come into camp? Well, we're quite lucky. They don't really raid camp uh, in this part of the world, but they do in other places. They can actually be an incredibly big problem. And uh, as I said, they've got those massive canines, so they do pose a threat. Um, they can pose a very big threat and a very big danger to humans. But generally, that only happens when people feed them. Okay, well, looks like they're all... Oh, there's one little guy hiding behind the bush. Well... <laughs> oh, tired. It's nearly bedtime. Uh, you're probably only about 10 more minutes before bedtime. But while we sit with these baboons and see what they get up to, uh, let's go see what Mr. Tingana is doing. The beautiful male leopard is still up in the tree, Tingana, still enjoying it up there. Nice cool breeze. And um, we haven't moved, we're still going to sit here for a while. This is such a beautiful sighting, it really, really is fantastic. And we are so fortunate to be able to spend time with a big male leopard like this, so relaxed, up in the tree, giving us a beautiful, beautiful show. This really is incredible. Again with the pose, he's moved slightly, but just at that pose with the legs on the other, on either side of the branch to keep balance. And you can see how full that belly is. Oh, let's see what he does. He's going to move. Uh, just lift the legs up. Oh, hang on. There we go. That's really beautiful, and I think he may have done that. to try and enjoy the sunset. <laughs> if you have a look off to our right, you might get a beautiful view of the sunset. Let's see if Ian's able to show you. How's that, Ian? Oh, look at that. Beautiful, beautiful sunset. A wonderful silhouette of the trees. Denise, um, <laughs> your your question and your comment. Um, now, some of you might start shouting at me. 
And that's okay. And the, uh, just my opinion, though. And Denise, you say, well, you know, a lot of the other guides refer to Karula as the queen of Juma. Um, would we consider Tingana to be the king? <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know how I feel about calling leopards kings or queens of, of areas. Uh, because they are, I mean, I understand that we get to see Karula a lot, and she is a beautiful female leopard. She does move through the area, um, and her, the central part of her territory is on Juma. Um, maybe, maybe we can ask Brent that question. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know the best way for me to answer it or what the best way for me to answer it is um, because I am like I said it's, it's wonderful to see these leopards and for them to move around and this is the dominant male leopard on the area so if you want to refer to him as a king then possibly It has beautiful spots on the legs and the rosettes on the rest of the body. Very, very beautiful patterns. And apparently, and I've never touched a leopard, but apparently their coats are very, very soft. Some of you may have just caught a glimpse of the track on the other vehicle. Looked like it was he was right underneath the leopard. It was just the perspective that from where we were sitting, he wasn't underneath. He was actually quite a distance behind the tree on the other side, and um, and on the other side of the termite mound. And they have moved off, but you see that big termite mound. So the vehicle was actually parked behind there, and um, and was quite away from the leopard. It was just from our perspective where we look, were viewing from it appeared as if he was a lot closer but he was definitely nowhere close to the leopard or underneath it and um, e every area is different and every uh, lodge is different um, um, in these areas in the northern Sabi sands the trackers do stay on the vehicles uh, or on the front of the vehicles um, generally when I guide and uh, a lot of the lodges that I take guests to we get the trackers into the vehicles when we get into big cat sightings or predator sightings and the only reason is it's not a safety issue at all but um, but occasionally you may cause the animals to react a little bit to the vehicles because the tracker does stand out a bit on the front of the vehicle and you don't want them to react to the vehicle in any way and if he does move or um, or any quick movement may cause an animal to move away um, and then also from a photographic point of view what we what we prefer is if the tracker is in the vehicle it's easier if the animal moves around and changes positions you can still get photographs at different angles on the vehicle uh, otherwise you might have a and the tracker in the picture a few times you've got to reposition the vehicle so all of those considered i prefer getting the tracker into the vehicle and the, i think the trackers also enjoy a bit of a break and sitting inside for a bit so they usually join me um in the front just next to me and then uh, um and then we can enjoy the sighting and uh, you don't have to worry too much about movement or anything like that disturbing the animals but as I said, some lodges are different, and they've got different procedures. And some lodges keep the lodges, uh, they keep the trackers on the vehicles. So it all, it all varies, and it all changes. But I prefer to get a tracker in. Heidi. Yes, some of the big cats do indeed keep their claws exposed, not these leopards however, um, but a big cat known as the cheetah. Now the cheetah, they do not have retractable claws like lions and leopards, so their claws are constantly out and you will constantly see them. The reason for that is the cheetahs built for speed and they, built, um, they, they need the traction for when they are running and moving around. So you tend to see the the, um, the cheetah's claws out all the time. 
but generally with leopards only when they're climbing or if they uh, if they're moving around or hunting if they grab prey then you'll see the claws exposed and all they do is they contract muscles and those retractable claws then come out and they raise it razor sharp same with lions Sarah from G Sarah from Georgia, you wanted to know how old Tingana is. So he is um, about 10 years old now, I believe. He was born in 2006. So he's still in his prime. He's still got a few years ahead of him. And uh, and for the moment, it doesn't seem like there's really any leopards to challenge him for the territory and that's why this male leopard has got such a big territory it's been very successful been able to mate with a lot of females and for leopards that is success have a large territory mate with females and have offspring very quickly then. so special that we've been able to spend so much time with this leopard it really has been a fantastic sighting and um, he's still uh, still very comfortable up in the tree he's not too phased about moving at all um, and I think again because that cool breeze blowing on him so he's uh, still very very comfortable up there sightings like this at times and, and when I am guiding guests you don't really have to speak too much about what's going on it's just really nice to sit and appreciate all the bird calls around us and I know a lot of our viewers too have been enjoying the bird calls and listening to some of the birds around there's some there's the red chested cuckoo calling again that and then the a lot of woodland kingfishers at the moment calling in this area. Oh, and there goes a woolly neck stalk. I haven't seen those for a while. Possibly might even have a nest up there somewhere. I saw another one fly in the area, but that was a woolly necked stalk. There's another tracker underneath, or well not underneath, on the other side of the termite mound. There's another vehicle that joined us in the sighting. And usually when we when we are guiding guests and we're taking people on safaris it's um 
it's nice to purely comment on on what's happening obviously we get questions about general behavior and that but a lot of questions we get from guests are related to what the animal is doing in that specific moment or what we tell them is usually why the animal or what why the animal is doing what it is doing and just speak about the behavior that is going on in that specific moment there's no need to really go into too much detail about gestation periods or anything like that if you've got a beautiful male leopard just lying on a on a or in a tree um, but again it, it's important to know all that information because if you do get into conversations especially regarding territory and mating with females then you need to go into that so it all depends on the questions that the guests ask us um, but like, as I said, sometimes, especially guests that you have been on safari a few times, they do just enjoy the sighting and uh, enjoy taking photographs and listening to what's going on around us. Just wait, there's a vehicle that's just moving out. Just want to see which direction they go. It is nice that the people that people do get to come out on safari and enjoy these sightings with us while we're out here. We've had a lot of visitors um, that do watch Safari Live regularly and it's always great to meet some of the viewers, chat to them and they get to meet the team which is lovely. <laughs> it's, it's quite funny being out on safari and seeing a vehicle and greet them as they drive past and, they, and then one or two comments, so oh, we, we watch you on, on safari live every day. It's, uh, it's quite an experience. I hope the viewers all learn a lot while they do watch us. Now, Heidi, you wanted to know about that woolly neck stork. Is it a migratory bird or is it found here throughout the year? And um, the migratory or the, the woolly necked stork does generally occur um, in southern Africa throughout the year. Um, but, but there are some 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 pairs and or some some of the storks that do migrate. Um, so it depends on the area that they're in. I think KwaZulu Natal, you tend to see a lot more residents in that area. Um, they they listed as near threatened, so they um, not many of them left around. But uh, you do have non-breeding migrants that uh, that move down into or further north, and then um, but there are. Uh, they are generally uncommon in this area, but they, they do stay, they are resident within Southern Africa. I think what we'll do is we'll spend another five minutes or so with this leopard, just see what he gets up to. Um, I might change our position slightly, and while I do that, let's head over to Brent for an update and see what he's, he's got. Well, welcome, welcome back. Lovely to have you with us again. Now, we've made the call not to go back towards Hosanna and Shongile. The baboons are quite close by. There's no one there. It is getting towards the end of the day. So we'll just let nature play its course in that area. Now, there's always a chance we're gonna find Karula. The last place she was heading was to the north here. So I'm just gonna slowly check along the edge of the Mawati. Maybe she pops up. I'm pretty sure she would have heard those baboons and moved away from that area. Uh, so hopefully, 
some luck with the king and queen, or maybe we'll have some lion luck as it gets darker and cooler. Maybe the, the lions that were around this morning go for a drink. So those of you who keep an eye on the Juma Dam Camp, let me know if the lions pop up there. I would be most appreciative. Now, even though someone switched off the heater, the sun went down, it is still quite warm. I'm guessing it's probably still around 30 degrees C. And what's that, Fahrenheit? 7, 80 something. So it's still quite warm. But compared to what it was an hour ago, it's, it's, it's blissful. Now, Sean, who's in South Africa, says he can hear cicadas in the background. Could I show you one? Well, that's quite difficult, Sean. I, you can just, if I keep quiet, you're going to hear that for a second, that high-pitched. That's a cicada. Uh, I'll try at night. During the day, it's, it's quite difficult to find them, but I'll try it with the spotlights a little later. Hopefully, we have some luck. And they do like these. Actually, maybe let's try for fun. They do like these peltiforums, these weeping wattles. Now, normally when you get close to them, they keep quiet. These, are, these guys sound like they're quite high. It's almost deafening under here. The lower ones have gone quiet and they've got amazing camouflage. Let's go deeper in, see if I can find a low one. So they keep quiet when you get close to them. This is incredible, I can't see a thing. Ah, I've got one more trick up my sleeve. Let us try this. Ooh. That one sounded quite close. Maybe I can spook one. It's, it's so amazing that they're literally calling all around me and I can't see a thing. Okay. Let's see if I get up to cicada height. Nope, their camouflage is still working very well. That's a pity. I was sure I'd be able to spot one from up here. Hmm. They seem to be even higher now. Now, how do we get down? No, I'm only joking, this is not a particularly high tree. I just can't believe it. I mean, they sound like they're right on top of me, but I still can't hear them. Let's hope I'm a little bit more graceful than Hassan has been over the last little while. Now they're all going quiet. I should give Hassan a tree descent lessons. But sometimes at night it's a bit easier. Now, one of the, the worst things about cicadas, and you've got a lot of different species of cicadas, and you get some very big ones. And in the Mapani woodland, further north, they literally take over. There's just thousands upon thousands of them. And when you're driving long distance, especially, or even the Miombo woodland, right, the worst was when I was driving 
long distance in Botswana through the bush between Maun, which is the town, and uh, the safari camps, which were about 250 kilometers away. But it used to take about nine and a half hours <laughs> because of the thick, thick sand. You're in second gear, low range for most of the time. And you'll be driving, no aircon on those old land cruisers we had over there. Off you go, and one or two cicadas would manage to get through your window and under your seat, and you had this incessant scream inside this car, and you'd have to stop, and it'd take you 10, 15 minutes to find the offending cicada screaming away somewhere under your seat or behind your seat, or somehow got into your toolbox. It, it just amazes me the places they can get. says uh, while I was climbing the tree in search of cicadas uh, you could almost hear a change in the cicadas voice going no Brent don't find us well I didn't so whatever they did worked uh, you could definitely hear a pick up and drop off in the sound as I got closer to them now this is where I was hoping Krula might make an appearance and there's a very strong possibility she might even get all the way towards the Voyatilla dam on her hunt so keep a squiz out there as well for the Queen of Juma. Now there is a lot of water to drink around with all the little mud wallows having water in it so not they're quite spoilt for choice about where to stop for a drink. Lindsay is wondering what is the strangest animal I've ever woken up to in my garden or at home. Oh, that's a... Well, I've had lots of them. I've had lion, leopard, hippo, elephant, buffalo, rhino, um, wild dog, cheetah. But I think the strangest one would have to be a water chevrotain. Now, well, I suppose it was my house. It was my tent with a little roof over it that I lived in in the rainforest. And uh, outside was a water chevrotain. Now, do you guys do yourself a favor? I don't have a picture of one. It's not something we, we find around here too often. Uh, it's basically somewhere across between a pig and a diker. <laughs> It's not an antelope and it's not, a, it's not a pig, it's somewhere in between, it's its own family. So I think if I remember correctly the spelling, it's water and then Chev, C-H-E-V-R-O-T-A-I-N, water chevrotin. Uh, and they are endemic up to, or they live in the Congo Basin rainforest and they've got canines, like big canine teeth, and they hunt insects, millipedes, birds, as well as eating fruit, leaves, and, and things like that. And we had a couple that used to hang around our, our camp in Gabon, and they became very, very relaxed. So, I mean, they would literally, you could pass within half a meter of them. And strangely enough, so, I mean, it's a pig, diker, leopard, basically. There's this weird combination. So their, 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 their social structure and mating structure is the almost identical to a, a solitary large carnival a cat so it has a male who will have three or four females within a territory that he'll defend and fight vigorously uh, and fight to the death and they make some very weird noises as well the water chevrotain uh, that's probably the weirdest thing but it wasn't really my garden i suppose it was luongo national park but i mean literally half a meter from the entrance to my tent in the garden i'm trying to think now I had a crocodile in the garden, it's quite a strange one, uh, in, in, in Zambia. I know the strangest thing I found in my garden was my best friend's after New Year's Eve party. They were, they were looked very strange, passed out in the grass, but no, that's not it. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I've had so many different things. We've had mambas, we've had spitting cobras. I've had spitting cobras under my bed. I've had spitting cobras in my bed. And bush babies in the roof. So uh, one of the, the joys of living out in the bush, you do get to have some strange neighbors from time to time. 
I'll try to remember some other weird ones. Hyenas are a normal, common one, trying to steal the rubbish bins. Uh, flamingo in Botswana, a very lost flamingo uh, outside our house uh, on the Tamilakani River in Maun in town. They, they do breed in the Makadikadi salt pans, but there's one lost flamingo. Hmm. I'm trying to think, I, I mean, really strange things. Well, that camp in, in, in Gabon, uh, while we weren't there, uh, our camera trap found chimpanzees inspecting our camp while we were at a fly camp, which was quite interesting watching the, that camera trap footage. We never had a gorilla in camp though. They came close once or twice, but we didn't, we didn't ever have them in camp. And of course, lots of weird bugs and hohos and frogs and things over the years. Now, not so much here, but uh, in the Natal Midlands where it's quite wet. Uh, and I think most people call them Wellingtons, those big plastic boots for when it's wet and you're up on the farm. We, we used to call them gum boots. I'm not sure why, but that's what we call them. And uh, one of the worst and, and, and biggest frights you get is uh, <laughs> when you're not really thinking and it's five o'clock in the morning and you're going out fishing or you're going to do something on the farm, uh, going to fix roads or, and you pull your gumboot on and there's a big red backed toad at the bottom, you do tend to squeal. Whoa, what's that? And it's cold and it's slimy. But anyway, that's, that's, that's never a pleasant one. Out here, we gotta be more careful about scorpions in our boots, always check them in the morning. And it sounds like, here we go, you've posted, so people have found pictures of the water shiver tain, posted it on, online. Uh, thanks very much, how cool is that? What a weird looking little creature. So that, that tall hind leg sloping down towards the lower body. They're also excellent swimmers. They live mostly around the edge of marshes and stuff uh, in, in the Congo Basin rainforests. And they become very, very relaxed uh, around you. And I mean, we had, a female and a baby that basically were in our camp nearly every day. But yeah, so I've been lucky. I, I, I don't consider that bad luck to have strange things in your garden or in your bed. It's good luck. Nothing's ever, hasn't, nothing's ever bitten me yet, and it's touch wood. Hopefully they never do. But while we go and see what's happening around quarantine, uh, let's go get an update and see what Byron's up to. So we left in Tingane, it was still up in the tree. Um, our signal was a little bit difficult in that area, and um, but he, he was seemed like he was very comfortable and resting up there. So we thought we'd just come and have a look around the area where we thought those lions headed off to. I'm not sure if Jamie and, um, and Herbert had any luck. I don't think so this afternoon. But um, but we just wanted to see if we were lucky and maybe they stuck their heads out and started moving around. Maybe we hear them calling. We know they were very vocal yesterday and this morning. So that's what we've come to have a look for. Pretty soon we'll get the spotlights out. It's not quite dark enough just yet. It's actually very light this afternoon. I think the um, further we get into summer, Sorry, I was just getting an update from Jamie. She said it looks like those lines may have headed towards the drainage line near Gallego shortcut. Maybe they came out there somewhere. Um, but um, as I was saying, moving further into summer now, it's going to get darker a lot later in the evening. And up here in the low felt or in this northeastern part of South Africa where we are, I think uh, sunset may, I mean, it's gone down already, but it may be closer to about seven o'clock or so in the middle of summer. However, um, down in the Cape, 
So the south western part of South Africa, down in the in Cape Town, there the sun in summer will set quite late, nine o'clock, half past nine, I think. VM is that right? Somewhere around there, I think. So much, much later. But we don't have daylight saving time in South Africa, which is great because it doesn't confuse anybody. <laughs> we, and I think it would confuse far too many people if we were to change anything. Oh, there's some impala up ahead. Let's see if there's a little lamb, perhaps. Is there one there? Oh, there is, there is, there is, there is. Okay, great. Let's see if we can get a view quickly. There's a few here. Oh, one, two, three, four. Hang on. How's that, VM? I don't want to move too much forward, too much further forward. Look at that. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> two little lambs. Oh, that is really, really wonderful. There's another one or two. And there's one off to the right a little. There we go. Oh, that one, that one looks like it's just been born. See the female still cleaning it? And look at those bandy legs, still very uneasy on its legs. I'm trying to see if I can see any other sign that, that I can tell if it's just been born. Looks like um, that female is, a, I, I don't see any blood on her rump. Sometimes you can see a little bit, bit of blood around, but she's cleaning that lamb and that lamb's gone straight to suckle. So I, I think that was born very, very recently, everyone. Let's see how it, or if it's able to keep up. Oh, sorry, something flew into my eye. <laughs> um, the joy of having insects around this time of year. Um, oh, that is very, very cute. Wonderful. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly these little lambs are able to get up and move around within minutes after birth. So that is really, really lovely. I'm not going to spend too much time here. I think there's Impala all going to head out towards some clearings uh, for the evening, especially with these little lambs. They want to look after them, and it's easier to keep an eye out for any potential predators when they are out in the clearings. And I see they've all made a beeline to this little area around here. They might just end up spending the evening on this area off to my left. Excuse me. They... Um, I think they, uh, they know exactly where the safety is and where the clearings are. Let's put these lights off for these little ones. Uh, Jay, we do not have any springbuck in Juma. They occur in different parts of South Africa. Oh, look at these little lambs. <laughs> Just off to the side. Uh, Jay, they occur generally in semi-arid or desert areas they prefer drier conditions that's generally the um, the, the uh, habitat that the springbuck prefer so we do not get them in, in this Kruger area at all in this northeastern part of South Africa. No springbuck here. They generally down the south um, southeastern part of South Africa, central and southeastern part of South Africa, and then up to the northwest, up in the desert and dry areas up there, you get a lot of springbuck around there too. Uh, so, but not here at all. the spotlights I might see if we can start using it let's see if we find anything it's kind of that awkward time of the evening where it's not quite dark enough for a spotlight and not quite light enough for us to see properly but you never know we could still find something still continuing the search for a chameleon we haven't seen too many chameleons yet this season 
and I wonder why we have had rain but perhaps not enough and it has been a bit cooler So Kalmani, you want to know with those impalas that we just saw, will the females look after all the young? Will they share the suckling with the young or will they only look after their own young? They will only look after their own young. Each female will look after their own little lamb and that lamb will stay close to that female for uh, just for I'd say a few weeks or a few months um, perhaps and then uh, and then that, that lamb will very soon start feeding on vegetation, just follow the, the herd around. And I mean, you've seen how quickly they, they grow, especially those yearlings that we've seen. Some of the young males already, you can see the little horns from last year. So they do grow very, very quickly. I really have a feeling we're going to find a chameleon in this area. I don't know why, I just do. Let's see what else we can find. Haven't seen a scorpion for some time. Well, actually on the bush walk, I think Jamie had one this morning. I had one yesterday, so yeah, on the walks, yes, but not at night. Let's see if we can try and find an active one at night, perhaps. Is that it? No, that's a leaf. <laughs> Occasionally, if a leaf looks slightly lighter green and it does look like it may be a chameleon they've got a different shade of green to them but they're still very difficult to spot obviously oh, there's a beautiful cool breeze now finally the temperatures cooled down it's been a very very warm day today with shining the spotlight and driving trying to answer questions is I sometimes take my eyes off the road which is not ideal <laughs> every now and then I get a slap to the face by a bush <laughs> just to wake up I suppose Nothing. Oh dear. But not to worry. I think we're gonna still have some luck. It's always too soon to panic. Like I always like to say. Sorry, some impala. Good evening, everyone. So I'm not gonna shine on them. Just shine around the trees. Jay, you want to know what is the one thing I hate about living in the wild? Uh, um, I don't think there's anything I hate, Jay, to be honest. Um, I think uh, with being out in the bush regularly, f uh, fortunately I do still stay, I live in Johannesburg, so I'm back there a lot more than I am out in the bush. But living out in the bush, and when I did live out here permanently, I think one thing I, I missed, I'd say, rather than hated, was um, perhaps family and friends. You know, you have a lot of friends back home, and you tend to miss out on on events and uh, <laughs> funnily enough I think the thing I missed the most to be honest was playing rugby uh, I used to play a lot of rugby and uh, when then when I moved to the bush I couldn't anymore because I was working permanently and I, I missed sport I missed playing sport but now with being back in Johannesburg um, I've been able to go back to my old rugby club and um, and still play a bit of, bit of rugby believe it or not I suppose I'm not too old just yet even though the body takes a lot longer to recover but <laughs> I would say that was one of the things I missed yeah definitely I missed that so much so it's nice to be able to play some sport again but fortunately I do still get out to the bush a lot We're going to continue our search on little nocturnal animals. While we do that, do that, let's head back to Brent for an update and see what he's got.
Hello, hello. Now, apparently you would like to know what I hate about living in the bush. I don't hate anything about living in the bush. I, I choose, I love living in the bush. Uh, there's a couple of things one does miss from time to time. And I think it'd probably sushi. What about you, Claude? Claude says ladies. He says there's not enough ladies living in the bush. Uh, <laughs> that is true. Uh, quite often in remote areas, it tends to be a uh, in general, not always, but a, a male-dominated environment. But yeah, I'd say sushi is definitely one thing that's quite nice, and always catching up with friends you haven't seen in a long time. But I'm one of those strange people, even when I go on holiday, I normally go to the bush, and my family lives in the bush. So, <laughs> so sort of bush-focused, aren't you? And I was hoping that those lions might have popped out, but there's just impala. Let me just turn the lights off. Uh, Final Control says, don't I hate mosquitoes and ticks? No, I don't even hate mosquitoes and ticks. I, I get irritated by them, sure. But uh, they are just as important as lions and leopards in the whole ecosystem. And they have a very important role to play in, in controlling of animal populations and and uh, providing food for ox peckers and, uh, and well, mosquitoes providing food for lots of geckos, spiders, skinks, lizards, frogs. So, no, I don't, I don't really hate, I get irritated, I don't really hate anything out here. I hate exotics. Don't like exotics. Uh, so when I mean exotics, that that would be sort of invasive plant species or animal species that are, shouldn't be in in an area. Don't like those. I hate those. Yeah, past the impalas. Oh, I wonder where those lions disappeared to. We're in that sort of weird half light where spotlight actually doesn't really help, and I got a better chance of spotting with my eyes. Hmm. And uh, living out here is, it's, at, at Juma is very comfortable in comparison to some of the other places I've, I've lived. I mean, Hutzbeet's only an hour and a half away. Uh, where I lived in Tanzania, the closest town was four and a half hours on really bad roads, up hills, through mountains, and uh, then it was more of a village than a town. And uh, in Gabon, it was a two and a half hour boat trip across some sometimes very big seas uh, to get to an even smaller village. That village probably only had about 30 people living in it. Uh, one little shabin, if you're not sure what a shabin is, it's like in the, uh, a sort of informal bar uh, that very seldom had beer, mostly had some of the most foul smelling palm wine you've ever come across in your, in your life. But I mean, the joy of living in the bush and makes those little hardships endurable. I mean, getting to see things like gorillas and forest elephants and lions and leopards and baboons and, and impala babies, all those type of things for me nullify anything and I can't really say I hate anything about living in the bush. Maybe final control. No, only joking, final control. Okay, so, yeah, there we go. That's a great one from Gert. I hate not being in the bush. That's a great one. <laughs> Wendy, uh, don't I hate hairy caterpillars. Oh, Wendy, it came close that day when my skin was on fire. But then again, when they're not crawling on my body and I find them on the dashboard, I get really excited because they are really beautiful and incredibly incredible little creatures, the way they're structured, their defense, uh, defense, defensive mechanisms uh, from birds and from me sitting on them and, <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. So no, I don't hate them, although it came close that day when I couldn't touch anything. I just basically had to sit in the middle of the floor with my arms out because every time I touched even skin on skin, it just started itching and welting again. No, 
we're very, very lucky to live in the bush. Uh, very privileged. There's very few people who, who are able to live the life that we do. Now, of course, some of it's luck, but you must remember a lot of us have <laughs> done the hard yards to get here. And as you say, there's a lot of things that aren't easy. And uh, but there's so much stuff that's so wonderful that makes those things that aren't easy. So lack of normal amenities or restaurants and things like that. It's a minor thing when you, when you get to spend your afternoon with uh, leopards and lions and elephants and bird watching or bugging or frogging. Uh, far better than going for a fancy meal in my opinion. And uh, I probably, I think, uh, not myself, I mean, I, I'm quite lucky, I'm, I'm an old hand, I, I, I grew up at it, but I would probably say, I think the thing a lot of people find most difficult about, uh, difficult about living in the bush for, for long periods of time is the fact that you, you often bunch together with the same people day in and day out. And, uh, and as in all situations that uh, even your best friend can irritate you on, on a bad day. But I think that that's probably what most people find the most difficult about living in the bush. It's the fact that the, the social circle is quite small and your, your workmate is your, your friend after work, but you can have a tiff during work, but you've got to leave it at the door the moment, moment work ends. And sometimes that can take people a, a little time to, to adapt to. Moz, who are brand new viewers, welcome to Safari Live. And oh, there's a chill of a Woodlands Kingfisher to welcome you. And let's hope he does it again while I'm talking. Oh, one sec. And so, oh, excuse me. That was a big sneeze. Uh, and they would, Ariel and Mods would like to know what is final control. Final control is where the evil ladies shout at us in the air. No, I'm only joking. Final control is where the directors sit. And you must remember, sometimes they have multiple screens up there. Today, they would have had three. So they're watching what I'm doing on one screen. They're watching what Byron's doing on another screen. They're watching what Jamie's doing. And they're making the, f the, the, the show flow. So they will say, okay, we've been with the leopards. Byron's got Tingana. He's going up a tree. Let's link to him. So they control where the camera will, what you're seeing, where it's going to go. And they do do an absolutely fantastic job. I was only joking. We don't hate them. Uh, although I did accidentally put a scorpion in Geraldine's bed. No, again, I'm only joking. And uh, well, we are coming towards the end of the uh, sunset safari. It's been absolutely splendid uh, having you with us and look forward to doing it all again in a few short hours on the sunrise safari. But let's go across to By Byron for the final minute of the drive. So we haven't had any luck just yet. But it was a wonderful day. I hope you've all enjoyed it just as much as we did. I mean, we had a lot of activity. Leopards around and no lions this morning. Unfortunately, no lions this afternoon, but that's the way it goes sometimes. If they don't want to be seen, you're not going to see them. I'm just scanning these trees very carefully just to see if I don't miss anything. The other night we did have a beautiful genet. It was great to see a large spotted genet. Uh, some waterbuck and impala all in the clearings there now. Sorry, I don't want to shine on any of these impala. There's a lot of impala out in the clearings at the moment. I think I keep the light off of them for a while. But um, a big thank you to all our viewers again. You know, we really appreciate all your questions and your comments. It's lovely to ha to hear from you. And hopefully, hopefully, as I said, hopefully you enjoyed the afternoon safari with us or sunset safari with us. 
and thank you very much to the voices in my head or rather the ladies in control or final control uh, Terry and Rebecca and thanks to Brent and Jamie and the cameraman uh, Jean Ray and oh, VM with me thanks very much VM and uh, on the other vehicle we'll see you all tomorrow morning good night and goodbye everyone